This is the Hagman and Hagman Report for today. It is Friday, 20th day of September 2013. I'm Doug Hagman. With me is my co-host, my son Joe Hagman. Together we are the Hagman and Hagman Report. Folks, you're about to hear three hours of unbelievable programming today. Um, I want to say that you're listening to the only show that news is presented to you in 3D. We, We look beyond the headlines and bylines, bring you the news behind the news. Folks, we broadcast... Each weeknight, live, 8 to 11 p.m. Eastern Time, our home base is HomelandSecurityUS.com. We're also simulcast by the Christians United Broadcasting Network. Now, I want to tell you, we're in the final countdown to a one-world government. This global power structure will usher in one world economy, a one-world economy, revolving around the biblical mark of the beast since the founding. Tom Horka, Steve Quayle, on uh, At The Ready. Folks, listen to A this secret before we get started. So consequential that its unveiling will crack the very walls that hold the nations together. A powerful clandestine group holds the key to the cipher. They alone have been the keepers of the secret destiny of America until now. Did something start in the year 2012? that will reach its astonishing zenith in 2016. Jesus, help us all. From the best-selling author of Petrus Romanus and Exo Vaticana. When our founders declared a new order of the ages, they were acting on an ancient hope that is meant to be fulfilled. Comes a shocking non-fiction book the U.S. government does not want you to read. It is a story of a new world that became a friend and liberator of the old. Something wicked this way comes. The occult desire of the ages is here. The affirmative task we have now is to actually um, create uh, Uh, a new world order. They want one world order, a new world order, at the end of this event. Novus Order Seclorum, a new order for the centuries, for the ages, forever. But the burdens of global citizenship continue to bind us together. Partnership and cooperation among nations is not a choice. British Prime Minister Brown today declared a new world order is emerging. We needed a new world order. A new world order. A new world order. We've got to give them a stake in creating the kind of uh, uh, world order that I think all of us would like to see. Once you know the secret, you'll know what you have to do to survive. Zenith 2016. To learn more, visit www.zenith2016.com. And that was the trailer, the audio trailer, for Tom Horn's new book, Zenith 2016, Did Something Begin in 2012 That Will Reach Its Zenith in 2016. Um, And that is a very good compilation of exactly what the New World Order is. And, folks, we have with us now Steve Quayle from stevequayle.com. We are waiting for Tom Horn um, any moment. We'll bring him on as soon as uh, he comes on. And his website is raidersnewsupdate.com. And I'll, many of you know he's the author of Petrus, co-author of Petrus Romanus. He's done extensive amounts of research on the Vatican and the role they play to the the Pope, the current Pope, to um, what we are seeing now and what uh, Steve's books have been about uh, for the last 10 years, uh, Angel Wars and Giants, uh, the integration of Nephilim and and hybrids being created uh, and introduced into our world through genetic manipulation, uh, a satanic plan that has been for centuries in the planning. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Steve. Uh, glad to have you on. And... Welcome. Now, is, Tom, is, is Tom with us now? I uh, don't see him in queue, no. but no, he, uh, he's, I'll he's... bring him on 
as soon as I do. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, unless it, he's calling from a, a different number, Steve. Unless he's calling from a different area code, different number, he's not on. Okay, he may be calling from a 441 number, I think. Do you see that? Uh, or, I'll, uh, I'll screen I'll screen these uh, a few of these calls that have the similar area code and I'll see if he is on hold, Steve. All right. Yeah, and okay. meanwhile, Steve, go ahead and take it. Uh you got you, you Okay, well, yeah, it. I mean, here's the thing. I'm excited tonight because as the world is headed more towards the cliff in your introduction from Tom's new book, Xena 2016, what's happening, Doug, is things are accelerating at such a pace. Last week when obviously, or almost 10 days ago now, when the Syrian uh, war was put on hold, it frustrated the plans of the Illuminists. But never fear, for they always have plan B, C, through Z. And even tonight, uh, I just posted on my alert section, and people have got to understand this. Look, everybody's got to grow up and understand that this is not, pun intended, Kansas anymore. We're all not wearing ruby red slippers. We don't get them to click back or click together, and we get to go back to Oz. And and the people, the entities, the non-human entities that are orchestrating in total agreement for the destruction of humanity, the human genome, the descendants of Adam and Eve, and the promise of the redeemed, that being us, are working overtime to bring as much mass casualties to the planet as possible. Now, for those who seemingly can no longer recognize the fact that this is not just going to stay an isolated matter when we go into Syria, the the gain has increased so dramatically that most people don't understand. And concurrent with the natural events, Doug, taking place, the supernatural reports I'm getting coming from whether, and again, I would encourage everyone to go to uh, my Dreams and Visions and my Alerts page. This is where the most important stuff comes in to basically show people what's happening. The the Stephen Hansen prophecy on Dreams and Visions has to be visited. I think that was in uh, almost, uh, what, uh, four or five, six years ago, talking about God showing him then these giant owls, these demonic entities, and those line up and sync up with Dmitry Dudeman's vision of the war that's being made against the saints. The time for discernment is so upon us that I don't know any any way to sort or filter outside of asking the living God, if you're a child of his, and if you're not, getting right with the living God, to show you the truth. It doesn't matter if I post six different eyewitness testimonies. The shills will come out and, and, and force and claim, well, you know, you're just a fear monger. I want everyone to know that when Jesus said that the whole world lies in the evil one, that the fear is present and resident. And I think that, uh, unfortunately, Doug, most people just don't uh, – recognize the fact of the lateness of the hour we're in. And and no matter how many guests you have on, now don't get me wrong, there are a lot of people listen to us worldwide, but I'm talking about those are the fortunate, those are those whose eyes have been opened by the living God, who mercifully have had their ears opened by the living God, and who really in most of the cases, most, not all, but I'd say the majority of the cases of people that listen generally want to know the truth. And that's why I just posted in my alert section that you must pray about this stuff. Because when when there are multiple reports, and this all has to do with what we're talking about today. Because when Tom comes on, we'll talk about, obviously, the New World Order. The, The statements coming out of Rome are the most contrary to biblical and historic Catholic doctrine that have ever existed. The statements you're looking at, ladies and gentlemen, the coming war in the Catholic Church, and let me just say this, it's going to be in the Protestant Church, war is going to be in all dimensions, all realms, and unfortunately you don't get to pick your war. As Pastor David Langford said, this thing is coming at us. You don't have to go looking for it, it's coming at us. So the point is is that when Tom comes on, we're, by the grace of God, going to share, you know, the mutual direction that the Lord has been giving us both in pursuing our specific, even though they're separate endeavors, they're like two different tracks, but the Lord is leading the, uh, if you will, the information to the obvious conclusion. In other words, there's a destination. I guess this is a good way to say it. Thank you, Jesus. There is a destination for all of the information that both Tom and I have been providing, books written, 
10,000 hours, 9,000 hours of, of video, uh, and I know that your show, Doug, gets downloaded so many times, and the last time that Tom and I did the show together with you a year ago or whatever, whenever it was, and I don't know exactly, the point is, is that you know, and some sites show it as a million views, some show it as a half a million, but these are people that know that this, the normal uh, information flow is not only flawed, but it's total, it's flawed because it's fraud. There's a new word. It's flawed, F-L-A-W-E-D, because it's fraud, F-R-A-U-D. And exactly. Steve, uh, we do have uh, Mr. Horn on with us now. Uh, Tom Horn, well, welcome Tom? to the Hagman and Hagman Report. Yeah, uh, it's great. I've been sitting here for the last uh, few minutes. I actually thought I was calling in early, so I do apologize. I evidently called in a few minutes late. Not a problem. I, I, was, I, I, I just, I just want to say uh, how humbled we are, it, it, and I, it, uh, uh, just to have you, um, your, 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 your book. Uh, I just, I, I thank you for for appearing with Steve and, and us tonight. Thank you so very much. Uh, Steve, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead and uh, go ahead. And take oh no, 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 Tom. I don't know if you heard it, but I said it's interesting that that the Lord has had you and I on parallel tracks, and that there's a destination. And I believe tonight is one of those, if you will, not only stage stops but railroad stops to putting it all together for people. Because Tom, you've been writing extensively. Uh, our, our our research has, if you will, paralleled each other for over a decade, and now we're at a point where the conclusions can no longer be denied. They have to be uh, uh, recognized, and they have to they they involve a response. So, would you share, if you would, and then when you're ready to give it back to me, give it back to me, so I don't interrupt you. I'm as excited, Tom, to hear what you have to say as a rest as I am to uh, hear any. Thing. And ladies and gentlemen, just so you know, Tom and I touch base through emails, but we don't get together ahead of time to discuss where we're going to go. So, Tom, what has the Lord specifically, you know, your obviously work on the Vatican, the work that everything you've done with the Polyon 2012, the, the situation now Zenith 2016, the concerns that you have are and, and, and wrote about prior to them happening, we just had the Pope, the Pope of Rome, the Vicar of Christ, basically deny that the just shall live by faith, that there's salvation, Jesus Christ. And again, this is not, how should I say this, uh, not to have been expected, because you wrote about it. So where are you at right now in drawing the conclusions of all your research? Because I did say all of that which you've done and I've done and all of us who have been doing this stuff for the decades is leading to a destination. Absolutely, and, and uh, thanks, Doug and Joe and Steve, for having me. Uh, on the show with you. It's a real privilege always to be able to come on the show and talk with you guys. And you know, a minute ago, Steve, when you said that our uh, mutual research often dovetails, overlaps, corresponds with one another, what most people out there don't know is that when that has happened, it's never been because you and I are even talking to each other about it. It's just astonishing that I'll be over here doing some top-secret research, you're doing some top-secret research, and then at about the same time we'll start broadcasting it, and more than once both of us have just stood there and scratched our head and said it's just astonishing how God was leading us down the same uh, path at the same time. But, of course, we know that there is a biblical precedence for that, right, out of the mouth of two witnesses. And uh, I've always been very thankful for that. Um, Steve, uh, yeah, I, I would love to talk uh, tonight about some current research I'm doing with an old friend of yours. Uh, former police detective Terry Cook and I have been doing some more of that top-secret research over the last uh, year, looking into what we are calling beast tech, because it involves something I want to talk about tonight concerning the coming mark of the beast, but it also includes more than that, the actual program, the system of the Antichrist. Well, so we'll see how much of that we can we can get through. And then ultimately, I'd also like to talk uh, later tonight, if we can, about some of that parallel research that you and I have been doing, your book, True Legends, that you were writing and we were unaware of about the same time we were writing Exo Vaticana, a large part of which is uh, a study into the increase in hyperdimensional entity appearances, which has happened throughout history, but currently seems to be happening more and more all around the world as the veil between our worlds gets thinner, right? Absolutely, and, and just as you've been detailing it, writing about it, I 
I honestly believe that we're living the chapters of Polyon 2012. Uh, true legends, Tom. I mean, even two days ago, I was contacted by a woman, and I'll be sending you all of her photographs and footprints of interdimensional big feet literally harassing this poor woman and her daughter. And let me say this, by anyone's standards, it is absolutely not only bona fide, but it is more evidence that uh, Bigfoot and Big Feet, whatever the plural is, you know, exactly. the bottom line is, is there is so much hyper-dimensional activity that tonight I think people will understand. And the neat thing is there's power in the blood of Jesus. God's word is true, but we have to warn the people, and not only warn the people, but again, we're giving them the antidote for fear. So take it, Tom, and when you're done, hand it back. All right. Well, uh, Steve, as you know, and as uh, Doug and Joe Hagman probably don't know unless you shared uh, that with them uh, privately, I was actually visited uh, about 10 days ago now by the Department of Homeland Security that actually came to my home. Uh, and uh, then, I, I don't think I told you this, I may have, but a couple days after that visit, uh, a small Department of Home, uh, Homeland Security like White Cessna uh, circled the top of my property for hours on one given day, and I actually drove out into the middle of one of my fields and looked up at them and watched them as they as they kept flying over and then and then skirting alongside where I was and looking down at me with their binoculars out of this plane. So, uh, but now <clears throat> I cannot discuss the details of the visit that was made to my house, but what I can assure people was that it wasn't because Tom Horn was doing anything uh, illegal. Uh, what it, I can tell you this much, what it had to do with was a legitimate business transaction between myself and a person in another country. And uh, the person in the other country is, I don't know if they're, what they're in, maybe involved with something, I don't know what, but it threw up some kind of a red flag and so i had this uh badges out visit uh to my home and before they left the dhs uh was asking me if i would be willing to alert them to certain types of contacts that could be made with either myself or my company and let's say in their opinion suspicious types that might be seeking some kind of intelligence and but what that visit made me realize or uh feel uh Steve Doug and Joe is that there's something there's something big that's that's the feeling and my son who's one of he's my business manager was standing uh outside with me as we had this visit we didn't let him inside the house but we were left with the sense that something really big is up and they're not about to let us know what it is but that US intelligence agencies are now taking these extraordinary measures to try to cover as much ground as they can and to gather, gather as much intel as they can between legitimate businesses and business people like myself that it sounded like they think could be targeted for what? Uh, some kind of information, some way to establish maybe a business inroad into the country that they then somehow use to try to legitimize themselves uh i that part was really unclear um but what they wanted us to to do what they asked us to do was to make them aware of any particular certain kinds of contact that uh i probably shouldn't talk about uh one thing i would tell you to note which is a public news story so i can say that much you notice today uh that there is uh a major security story about how the U.S. Department of Defense's Defense is ordering a security review at all of its military and uh, government facilities worldwide. You, have you saw those articles today? Well, am I still on? Oh, yeah, yeah, you are. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, we did see those articles, and it's interesting timing, um, to say the least. Go ahead, Tom. Well, because... What they're saying is that uh, they've ordered uh, these security reviews at all of the government facilities and military facilities, 
because they're saying, uh, you know, it has to do with the massacre there at Washington Navy Yard uh, a few days ago, and that uh, Aaron Alexis or whatever his name was killed uh, 12 people. But but the visit that came to me was at least a week before that event, and it echoed a lot of the same kind of information. So what I'm saying is there is something that is up. Now, of course well, – Tom, that, if, I can ask you, if I can ask you this, uh, because badges out, DHS – look, I, I fully comprehend that, believe me, on a personal level. But that said, what was the purpose of the flyover? I have in, no in idea. Your, yeah, it, it, that I have no idea. That kind of seems like it's out uh, from, pardon the expression, from left field. <laughs> well, I have a I have a hundred and fifty acre ranch, and so they were literally doing a perimeter fly around over and over and over and uh. over, and I have no idea uh, what whoever they were but but you know you've seen the dhs um plane oh, they're yeah. just the white Cessnas with the marking on the side whatever they were doing whatever they wanted i don't have any clue um i didn't wave at them but i sat there and watched them and they watched me right <laughs> well so, i think steve might have waved at them uh, but uh in the yeah, past but, yeah uh, yeah Wow. But, and 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 right at first, I I thought, is this Gary Stearman? Is this Steve Quayle? Is this somebody you know that's coming to check? But then I started you know watching the markings on the plane and the color of the plane, and you know that's typical. But here's the deal: I know it's National Preparedness Month, and you know during agency, you know during this time of the year, you get all these agencies that get nervous, um, and I can tell you that. Uh, even before I was visited, we were experiencing uh, much larger orders this time of the year at Survivor Mall of things like gas masks and potassium iodide and long-term storage foods. I'm sure Steve's been experiencing the same thing at his preparedness store at stevequail.com. And so it could be that it's just preparedness month awareness, and so they're taking these heightened measures to try to uh, reach out to business people like myself that does, and I do business with people all over the world, uh, and we're very aware of the things that we can't ship into other countries, right, like weapons and things like that, so we don't. And uh, we follow all of the rules. We know all the states, for instance, in the U.S. where we can't sell, you know, stun guns and, and uh, pepper spray, and, and so those are all blacklisted, and everybody that works in the warehouse knows. So we follow the rules so that we don't get into issues where you have something that's getting hung up, you know, in customs or whatever because it's not supposed to be sent into another country. This was this was different, and uh, we were – essentially we were just said – we were just told, would you be willing if – you get strange contacts, and it seems like they were using this business transaction really as more of an excuse in the same way that I think this whole uh, Aaron Alexis killing spree at the Naval Yard is being right now as to put a public face on something so that when people in communities where these military bases uh, and these government bases are at see all of the increased security around it, it's a way of providing you know through the media – Kind of a uh, kind of a um, you know an explanation about what they are doing, but um, I think there are people out there right now that are aware of or that are suspicious of some kind of either large scale attack that's being planned or multiple attacks that are being planned or something like that. You know, the Al Qaeda chief, uh, uh, what is his name, Amin. Al Zabahiri. He he released that audio message like last Friday, saying that the time is right now for large scale terror attacks inside the United States. Those are signals. A lot of times, it isn't just general conversation. Hey, we think it'd be a good idea. What can you dream up to go hit somebody? What they're what they're what what they have is they have people out there that have been planning events for a long time, and these people are just sitting there like idling trucks waiting for the signal. And then somebody like this Zawahiri goes on and says, the time is right now for large-scale terror attacks inside the U.S., and then he urges his fellow members of his extremist groups to start seizing opportunity, you know, to conduct either opportunistic or perhaps uh, large-scale strikes against the United States. And it could be something like that. Whatever it is, by the way, I'm glad that smart people – 
uh, are taking measures to survive whatever may come. Uh, even people that, that don't have a lot, a lot of uh, money, you know, can afford to buy inexpensive gas masks. They can buy potassium iodide, which costs 10 or 12 bucks and could keep them alive, that kind of thing. Um, Steve, what are you hearing, if anything? Are, you, are, are people that you know uh, in the military or uh, in other intelligence agencies or that have security clearance, are you hearing anything being said uh, brewing among these agencies, like they're hearing chatter that has persuaded them that something is amiss in the U.S. or might be? Is Steve still there? Uh, Steve, are you with us? Can you hear me now? There we go. Hello? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I heard what you said, Tom. The the the, the problem that I see and the and actually let me just read two of them that everybody who's listening to the show tonight have to have this in real time. The Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses let every word be established. When two people from different parts of the United States share the same almost a word for word warning or alert coming from different situations, how about this one? Did you receive this will answer your question specifically, Tom, and this is something everyone needs to hear. My fiance and I are getting married tomorrow. She's in the U.S. Air Force. We were out getting some last-minute items for the wedding. When we pulled up to our house, my fiance's boss and staff sergeant were at the door to notify her that their unit is going on standby on Monday the 23rd. When she asked her sergeant why, he said because, and he said the S word, is going down in Syria. These were his exact words, Steve, not mine. He didn't divulge any more details, probably because I was standing there. They were just here an hour ago. And today's date is Friday, September 20th. Now listen to this. Second witness. These came in about three hours apart. A Kansas uh, farmer called me 20 minutes ago to tell me that his father, injured in an accident, was in a coma. The family was called back for a bedside vigil. The tough old guy survived. One of the family members is a high-ranking Air Force officer. He informed his family that he had been called back to West Virginia and that he was to report tomorrow, same time that they're both to report. His only statement was, something really big is about to happen. This is not good. He gave no further information. And then Greg sent this to me. He said, speculation, the underground command complex is there on the Blue Ridge Mountains. This officer was agitated. So to answer your question, Tom, and for the sake of everyone listening, I don't know, do I sit on information like that or do I post it and tell people that, look, it's up to you to take it to the Lord. But based on all of my sources, they're all saying the same thing you said. Something big is up. They know it's coming. And look, here is the here is the quintessential hypocrisy going on in this country right now. How is it that we're sponsoring al-Qaeda, giving them weapons in Syria and everything, and then Zawahiri, who I am more than familiar with on a, an amazing level, and I'll leave it at that, is calling for the total, total, and, and by the way, as you said, Tom, when these guys go on and give a statement like that, that's a message. It is so analyzed by everybody in the NSA and CIA and every, every they look at his body motion, uh, his movements. Doug, these guys have this guy figured out, but these guys are pros. So to make a long story short, he gave a ghost signal. And with the Syrian contact in, my guess is this, and here's just an educated guess. Obviously, through Russian intelligence, through Chinese intelligence, through all the different chatter back and forth between the intel agencies, Agent B, who knows Agent A from the Cold War, they know the plan is to go ahead and proceed against Syria. doesn't matter what the U.N. says. doesn't matter anything. Given that fact, then I would guess that sleeper cells have been activated and that that would explain a lot of the uh, heightened state of alert and so much so that if I didn't know better, I would say that most of the uh, military equipment across the country is anticipating more than just, uh, quote, angry patriots. In other words, this is very so, uh, serious. And, again, what we're talking about tonight, now, Tom, I want to jump to something. The portals that you have written about, the gates of hell, which you taught me about, I am seeing so many reports of preternatural, supernatural, demonic, uh, UFO, that in essence, what we were telling would be the key signature of things getting ready to break loose and all, quote, unquote, hell on earth. 
I see those in real time now. I'm getting those in hourly reports, and one's only 150 air miles directly uh, south by southeast of me. So the thing is, is that what I'm hearing in talking to my my researcher Mac in in uh, oh Arizona, one of the guys that helped me with True Legends, he did a marvelous job for me, and others who are around Native Americans, whether it's Brother Marcus Samuel out in uh, South Dakota, the guys who are on the reservations up north in Montana, they're all claiming that the presence of supernatural evil is is beyond anything, and even the elders are commenting and letting it be known that there is a shift, there is a change, and in essence, the doors are open. Wow. Now, Steve, um, I would like to... Uh, uh, there's two things that I'm hoping we'll be able to talk about tonight. One is what you just we're talking about, uh, and the other uh, is what type of event, potentially a terrorist event or some other kind of event, a black uh, ops operation that's actually set in motion, which we know our own, you know, our, our CIA has started wars in more than just Syria, as they may happen to be considering it right now in the past, something like that. Um, in fact, that you know, the title of this new book, Zenith 2016, the idea that something started in the year 2012, and it's going to very quickly ratchet up until something explosive is occurring in the year 2016. It involves two different kinds of things. One is geopolitical. Uh, it involves governments. It involves uh, all-pervasive surveillance. It involves putting people in a position where they cannot say no. In other words, they are caused, as Revelation says, to receive a mark or uh, a system that then is going to bring them into this all-inclusive socialistic kind of, of, of antichrist system. I want to talk about that, but the other side of this is, the, is, is also 2012 to 2016, which means that a gateway is, is opening. And the further that gate opens, I mean, you can imagine a door opening that's got a light behind it or that's got darkness behind it, and the more it opens, the more you can see of it. And I really feel that right now, and I was with Gary Stearman yesterday in Oklahoma City. We recorded a couple of shows, and Gary said that they're probably the best shows uh, that he has ever done with me at Prophecy in the News. Now, not Steve Quayle level good, like I heard all about while I was down there. But probably he said the best, and this is what we were talking about, that, that something started, it's ratcheting, up, it's ratcheting up very quickly. It even has people like Gary Stearman and others who are usually, I mean, they're, just, they're very calm and collective, but I mean, they're really on edge right now because in the spiritual side of this, they can sense that something is racing now towards a moment, towards an event, and I think we all know where it's heading. So... In very general terms, I'd really like to talk about both, and we can go to either one of them uh, before the other, but I, I want to talk about basically the mark of the beast system, but not, not the mark of the beast. I want to talk about what are the events that may be uh, imminent right now that will set in motion a system from which the average person is not going to have the strength to resist, and then the other supernatural side of it that's going to put fear in the hearts of men as they see these things coming upon the earth. Which which way do you want to go with this first? Let's take the bottom line and let's go with the, the, the things that could put fear in the hearts of men. Because the bottom line is, Tom, I had been praying, and I know there are so many intercessors praying for tonight's show. You know, Jesus said this marvelous statement, and, and everything that Jesus said at the moment, the scripture that's the best in the Bible is the one we need for the moment, and it's all necessary for life. But, you know, Jesus said men's hearts failing them for looking after those things coming upon the earth. And also that I use it all the time because I said, Lord, how do we take the people into the point you want them to understand the true nature of the spiritual battle that's against them. I mean, Syria, bombs, rockets, exocet missiles, super sunburn, squall. All this is, is relevant in the physical war. But let's go with the supernatural right now, Tom, because I think that's, that's the thing that we're, we're faced with immediately. Because, again, and, and, and Jesus said, if I told you earthly things you believe me not, how can I tell you heavenly things? My question to the Lord in prayer all the time is, Lord, help us to articulate 
those who have called to warn, those who have done their homework to warn, those who have prepared the way to warn, how do we get them to understand that what they can't see, they will soon see, what they maybe have denied will become a present reality. I remember years ago, I can't find it, a prophecy God gave me five years ago, that the invisible will become visible and the stuff of men's nightmares would be manifest in their present material world. So let's go there and let's go go to your bottom line and then we'll work backwards. Okay, and then we'll work backwards. And I, The other is also spiritual because it involves, I think, well, first of all, it, invi- it involves information that we have received, uh, that we're going to publicize, and this may really cause the you-know-what to hit the fan, photocopies and transcripts of information uh, that uh, involve a government program that you can only think of as the implementation of the mark of the beast by the year 2017. So we'll talk about that hopefully uh, sometime tonight, but right now, yeah, this this uh, research that you and I uh, did into hyperdimensional entity appearances in ancient times, uh, I did read your book. We did write a review of True Legends for Raiders News Update. It is one of the best. You always write great, but this, I think, is one of your best, Steve. Between it and the Giants book, those are my all-time two favorites. But as I was reading through True Legends, uh, I couldn't help but, uh, you know, have at the, at the forefront of my thoughts the fact that um, uh, Chris Putnam and I had just you know uh, earlier this year and late last year gone to uh, uh, Arizona and we went up there to the Vatican's you know uh, astronomical research laboratory. But when we ca- are are um, there uh, anyway, the um, isn't that awful? My mind. Tell me tell me what's on the top of Mount Graham. The, the Vatican. Well, the Lucifer te- the Lucifer Telescope. <laughs> Yeah, well, anyway, their telescope, that's what I was trying to say. But it was when we came down off of Mount Graham, and we were talking about this actually on Hagman and Hagman, and we did the show with you. And right after we did that show with you, uh, I'm going to make this public at some point very soon. But a guy contacted me, and he said, hey, he said, uh, you're talking about how the Amer- – this guy's an American Indian. He said, you're talking about how the American Indians view that as one of the four holiest mountains in the United States because they see it essentially as what you would call a stargate. He said, that's what you were talking about when you and Steve were on the radio. Um He said, I can tell you that not only is that true, not only was it true, it's still true. Most of the American Indians that live in that area still believe that. And his mother, who is an Indian, has lived there for, I think he said, 55 years or something, most of her adult life. Well, guess what? She keeps cameras set up all the time, 24 hours a day, and you won't believe some of the video that they sent me. With you could, I could, you can only call these things like what giant sprites? These these lights that appear on the side of that mountain and that move about. I mean, it's very much UFO-like activity. But she also one night caught a very large circular disc-like thing that came down, hovered over the top of the Vatican's. Uh, the Vatican Observatory Research Group's uh, 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 systems up there, and sat there for a while and then moved back up off and disappeared into the clouds. Just the most astonishing video. So as soon as we can get this current documentary called Inhuman, which we'll probably talk about some of that kind of stuff tonight as far as transhumanism, but as soon as we can get that in place, we already are uh, interviewing different people on what we're probably going to call Exo Vatican of the movie, but it's actually based on uh, that mountain and what's going on up there and some of the similar uh, research related to what you and I have done in which we've discussed this biblical reality that there are other dimensional entities. And they have the ability, under certain circumstances, to move from their uh, dimension, their reality, into ours. And the Bible, despite what some of the naysayers may say, is literally filled with examples uh, and references uh, to that dynamic. In fact, um, you know, here the other day, I was reading again the story of Jesus going into Gadara, and something kind of stood out to me a little different as I was reading this uh, in the Greek language. He arrives, right, and the wild man of Gadara comes out there screaming, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. 
those entities that first of all they recognized him as the son of god but they feared that he was going to command them to do something now in most bibles it says that they that they uh, uh pleaded with him not to send them quote out of the country but read that in the greek language because essentially or or or, or literally what they said was don't send us out of the space between two places or limits now that is interesting uh, because the uh, the word there in the Hebrew it's a noun uh, Korah and it has as its first meaning the space between two places in other words it's a dimensional reality and they were afraid that he was going to send them out of that dimensional domain now there's a there is um, there's a reason to believe as we move uh, further into these current days, between now and, and 2016, or, or so long as the Lord should tarry, I'm not setting any dates, and I know you don't either. But there's a reason to believe that those kind of increased sightings of strange phenomena, like we now have on film below Mount Graham, um, that, uh, oh, and not only uh, those kind of sightings, but the hearing of sounds, right? like uh, the clanking of metal. Gary Stearman and I were talking yesterday about some of the emails, Steve, that you had sent me about like this, this, these humming sounds that people are hearing all over the place and how it makes them feel and how it seems to impact, you know, like upon their skin, like it's affecting them uh, somehow. And then uh, somebody sent me uh, this clinking sound, and I, the minute that I heard this large clinking sound, the thought that just jumped into my mind, I have no idea, by the way, if this has anything to do with reality, but it sounded like, you know, when you've seen movies where you see these Roman swords cl- uh, crashing against somebody's armor, it sounded just like that, and I just had a cold chill go up my spine, and I told Gary, I said, man alive, I said, what are what are we hearing in in the sounds that are being heard uh, heard all over the world and recorded now all over the world? I mean, is it too much to imagine, Steve, that we might be hearing uh, like other dimensional warfare, like angelic warfare, because we're moving towards that moment when we know that Michael and his archangel they're in great war with the dragon and his angels. We know that we're headed towards that conflict, right? Absolutely. And, and I echo those sentiments because, again, it, it, you know, it, it, what's interesting is, is that God spoke the world into existence. And, and the thing I'm working on right now is the sound of creation and the different interplay between sound, magnetism, and as it relates to the spiritual world. But what was fascinating, Tom, in talking to all the different people that have been interviewed when it comes to, and I'll just bring up Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Yeti, whatever you want to call them, it's the sonic nature that opens the gate. Now jump to the great structures of history and, 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 and the harmonic, which means vibrational frequencies, uh, levitation of amazing, uh, amazingly heavy. In other words, sound can overcome magnetism. Sound has basically been something that the ancients understood to to an infinite degree. So here's what I'm saying, and and I will be making a more further statement. I don't want to make a statement yet. I'm not ready to, but I think people are going to be blown away because the area that is being opened to me by the, and I believe it's the leading of the Holy Ghost, to warn us people is, is that when you're dealing with the book of Revelation, you're dealing with trumpets. You're dealing with thunders. You're We're dealing with the voice of the Lord. And if you look up the voice of the Lord in the Hebrew uh, Strong's Concordance, you'll you'll find out the voice of the Lord is an amazing thing. And it's that voice of the Lord. So just as Paul says there are many voices, and they all are to some effect in the New Testament, we're hearing sounds, in my opinion, that are gates opening that are swords clashing, that are the, it's the earth groaning, that it's the methane, as Doug Wayne explained to me, that it's a methane, too, bubbling up from under pressure at five miles deep, coming up even through things like uh, wellheads. And if you take the wellheads, listen to this, you guys. This will blow your mind. Thank you, Wayne. The wellheads are acting almost as a cacophonic 
organ from, uh, and this is my words, not his, but from the dark side, and the different diameters of those wellheads, the pipe that goes down that they pump the natural gas or oil on. So what I'm saying is, is that when the scripture, you're going to love this, when all creation travails, for the manifestation. That word travailing literally means howl, weeps, it groans, okay? And so this is what's going on. These are these are in time noises that are the signature of and I'll I'll make it simple. Heaven breaking forth, all hell breaking loose. Now isn't that amazing, Tom? Absolutely. And 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 uh there are words in the original biblical text that actually describe some of the activity uh, that you're describing right now. For instance, there's actually um, a word, it's a combination of words, in the Greek Bible that discusses how these other dimensional reality, how these other dimensional entities come through into our three-dimensional reality. For instance, there is a word, it's two words, but it's meta, and then it's schematizo. And you can read that in 2 Corinthians 11:14, where it's talking about Satan as able to masquerade or to transfigure into an angel of light. It kind of describes the, the meta-activity that is occurring as he moves from his dimension into ours and takes on a particular, and in this case, a deceptive uh, physical form, something that can be seen. I was talking to Russ Dizdar uh, in uh, Colorado not long ago uh, at the conference there, and we were talking about that, and he calls that the physics of the dark side, uh, literally the ability to transmute or to morph uh, their appearance from their dimension to ours while maintaining uh, their evil nature but cloaking it in a different kind of manifestation. So whether they come through and they appear as an ascended master or a regular human or an alien gray uh, or a Bigfoot or a Loch Ness or whatever, they come through, they can appear in whatever uh, these ways they want to, but they are masking uh, some other kind of reality, which is what they really are. Now, of course, we know that good angels uh, can also come through, and they too sometimes can appear different than what they appear to be on the other side, some of them are even indistinguishable, indistinguishable from humans. Um, another thing, Steve, when Jesus said of certain demons in Mark uh, 9.29, he said, This kind cometh forth by nothing but prayer and fasting. And the word there, kind, is genos. You probably know that because of all the research you've done into genetics, but it literally means a genetic Kind and it sometimes can be translated species. So it tells us there are different types of these ultra-dimensional beings, but it implies that that's uh, perhaps not only true in terms of their level of power, but also uh, in their appearance. That in that other reality, there are those that uh, that look different than other ones, leftovers maybe of uh, the Watcher experiments involving these human-animal combinations that in some way continues to resemble their uh, earthly composition before the flood, but now it's how they also are known in that reality. So perhaps over there they look like Bigfoot or they look like whatever. And, and uh, that has biblical merit because recall, as Jesus was similar in appearance after the resurrection, right? And also uh, Paul told the Corinthians that in the next life, we too will be known, quote, even as we are known. So there is some sense that uh, whatever those mutations were that were created in all these horrific experiments that are, I think, uh, kind of you have echo traces of them that are uh, recorded in like the Greek mythologies and the Egyptian mythologies. So you have uh, the body of a horse but the torso of a man or the head of an ibis and the body of a man or whatever. Those are like mute testimonies of something that happened at one time. And so they created these records. But perhaps in these other realities, you have these big, ugly, terrible-looking things that when they appear on this side, they may look like Bigfoot, but they may also have the capacity to uh, metaschizmatizo, to make themselves appear 
as something different. And now it's a lovely, large, uh, what do they call them, the Nordic aliens, right? Big, beautiful woman or big, beautiful man that is coming through this reality. Uh, but maybe if you could see them for what they really are, it would be so demonic and horrific that uh, then, of course, it would cause that individual who's being uh, visited to run away or to rebuke them in the name of Jesus Christ or whatever, but because they appear to be beautiful. They come as an angel uh, uh, of light. Another thing, Steve, about uh, your book, True Legends, and about these entities that can come through into our reality by some uh, Russ Dizdar's you know, uh, physics of the dark world, can, have you ever thought of the prophecy of the four horses in Revelation chapter 6? And when the pale horse rides in, notice what it says of him here. I'll just read it. Revelation 6, 8. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. Now let me stop and interrupt myself for a second. I want to quote this because a little bit later tonight, when we start talking about these events that may be imminent and that ultimately could lead to the arrival of both the Antichrist, the false prophet who could certainly be alive and on earth right now just awaiting the moment that they get their marching orders from the man of from the spirit behind the man of sin we're going to see the the rapid rolling out of the fulfillment of the book of revelation so what might be just around the corner let me go back to my quote revelation 6 8 and i looked and behold a pale horse and his name that set on him was death and hell followed with him and power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth. Now note what it says. To kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death. And note this. And with the beasts of the earth. End quote. Now Steve, uh, I do not believe that this text is implying that tomorrow morning my goldfish or my gerbil may suddenly go crazy and start attacking me. The word here for beasts of the earth is an important word. It's the Greek word therion. And people need to memorize this term because therion, it's a, it's, a, it's a strange but interesting word because it refers not only to a wild or violent beast, but it refers to a strange and violent bestial man. As a matter of fact, people listening to this show can even go to like the Strong's Concordance online and look up that text and then click on the word Therion and notice how it is described as a brutal, bestial man, savage and ferocious, In quote. Now, people should consider that when the Bible prophesies that the, the pale horse rider rides and now people are being killed with sword and with hunger and with death and with Therion, brutal, bestial men, savage and ferocious, uh, that this is going to be part of how a third part of the earth is destroyed. And I've always believed that the Bible means what it says. It kind of reminds of a conversation you and I had uh, uh, in one of the radio shows that we did a few years ago where we were talking about that army in the second chapter of the book of Joel. And a parallel in Revelation 9 that sounds like kind of an end times volcano of hybrids. And other, uh, uh, Isaiah uh, 13, other places, which talks about the fact that a moment is coming. Uh, and, it, and Syria being threatened is not only prophetic, it's part of those prophecies from the book of Isaiah, that if you continue reading the text, goes on to talk about how a gate's going to open and giants are going to come forth upon the earth, and even a hybrid, uh, 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 mythological-like, part human, part animal creatures are going to be there, not just in Syria and Damascus, but all, also in ancient uh, Babylon. Uh, what, uh, um, so that people know what I'm talking about here with Job, am I just going on and on too much? No, no, this is really critical. And, Tom, uh, years ago I coined a term which is so parallel to what you're doing. It's called T, Tango, M, obviously, Mary, D, Delta, E, Echo, T, M, D, E, and that's transmorphic demonic entities. 
and what I have written about extensively, and this is really, inc- what, you know, standard word shapeshifters, but what is interesting to me is, is that when the genetic corruption of not only humanity but also of all creation, which that's what the Book of Giants, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the fragments, and by the way, that's reprinted all there is that I have or anybody has, with the exception of the Illuminati, is reprinted in my book, True Legends. But what it shows is that when that corruption took place of the angelic genome, uh, fallen angels, interfere, uh, forgive me, intermixing itself with whether it was reptiles, whether it was birds, bees, fish, you name it, every myth and every legend, and i got to say this, after 40 years, I will not... I will not uh, uh, say that there is no visible, viable, intellectual challenge to this statement. In history, in antiquity, and myth and legend, it all has to do with the gods, the fallen angels, mingling, genetically manipulating the, not only the human genome, but the animal kingdom to the point where it, re- it repented God that he had created man. And he even wiped out a lot of his creation. That's why bestiality is so forbidden in the Old Testament, the penalty being death. And now we've got, I don't know what you call them, and, and pun intended, but you've got cat houses in Germany where people go to have you know, sexual relationships with animals. If this oh, no. isn't the appetites of demons being expressed through humans, I don't know what is. So this is what Jesus is talking about. And do you ever, can I ask you a question? I've never asked you this on the air or even uh, privately. Do you ever feel frustrated at the depth of the revelation that the Lord, and it's God's revelation, a man has nothing except to receive it from above, and the frustration of seeing what's coming, yet, yet the apparent denial of the things that are obvious in the natural realm, and I believe God's called you and I, and I'm not separating us, making us better, but we've been called independently and now as a cohesive uh, unit to prepare the people for the war that's coming against them from the spirit realm. Do you ever just sometimes marvel at that? Well, of course I do, and I have to say I'm also humbled by it. It's the kind of a thing that can bring you to your knees because, uh, I don't think myself or yourself or anybody like us or anybody that's in these circles, uh, you know, would take to ourselves anything special about that. It's actually kind of like a burden. Um, you know, uh, John on the island of Patmos, take this book and eat it up. And it's sweet like honey in his belly, but I mean in his mouth, but it becomes bitterness in his belly. And you look at all of the prophets all the way back to Moses. Here I am, Lord, send my brother-in-law, you know, or, what, or whatever. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's a struggle. But uh, all of the prophets, all of the people who had prophetic callings in the Bible, it seems like, at times wanted to run away from that uh, calling. So whether it's Jonah being swallowed by a well and spat out because he just doesn't want <laughs> to have to do the job of prophecy, or what you and I do today, knowing that we're going to be on this radio show and we're talking about these issues, and we know that it will be helpful to a lot of people, but we also know there's that other element out there, right? And they're sitting yep. there right now bl- blogging and talking and uh, how in the world can we figure out some way to discredit what these guys are saying. We know that that battle is ongoing. And, by the way, it's not going to get better. It's going to get a whole lot worse. And if we have a chance later tonight, I want to talk about the war that I think is coming, and it is going to involve the institution of the church, not the mystical body of Christ, but the institution of the church where brother will be set against brother in the very institutionalized sense of the word. That's already happening. It's happening right now, but I think it's going to get much, much uh, worse. Um, before well, let's I take the, let's, yeah, let's take that on in the second hour now. Joe and Doug, do we need to take a break right now? Yeah, yeah, we can. Uh, okay, and yeah, Tom, we'll when we come right back, now. yeah, when we come back, let's let's go directly into that because that's critical. Because I am seeing, and and listen, I want to make this clear: neither Tom Horn nor I are Catholic bashers. We are absolute, and I would call us investigative truth heralders. Okay, I, I, I've never used that term before, but the <laughs> like point that. is, is that there's going to be a battle in all realms and dimensions. And, and and when we come back, Tom, I want to get right into that thing because that's so critical to understand because it's going to be not only a daily occurrence, but it's going to be an hourly occurrence, and brother is going to be set against brother. So we'll, can we take that up when we come back? Sure. Okie doke. 
All right, with that, we're going to go to break. Folks, you're listening to the Hagman and Hagman Report on this Friday, September 20th, 2013, with a very special guest, Tom Horn and Steve Quill. You can find Steve Quill's website at stevequill.com. Tom Horn's website is raidersnewsupdate.com. Uh, check there as his new book. Um, I don't know if it's is it coming. Has it been released, Tom? Or it has it still... been. Zenith 2016. Okay. Yeah, we uh, played the trailer at the very beginning of the show. Uh, Zenith 2016. Uh, did something begin in 2012 that will reach its zenith in 2016? There's a short trailer on YouTube. You can check that out. And we'll be right back after these short messages. Stay with us. Welcome back, folks, to hour number two of the Hagman and Hagman Report. Doug Hagman with me in studio. Joe Hagman together. We are the Hagman and Hagman Report. The so excited to have uh, great great two great men uh men i respect men both joe and i respect immensely steve quail steve com. you got to bookmark his website go to the alerts the visions uh, exclusively too by the way he's the exclusive outlet for the grill economist at this point uh that's steve com, and of course tom horn prolific author what a fantastic writer uh I've, i'll tell you what uh, i've on my desk right now i've got uh both i got two books exo vaticana fantastic read as well as petrus romanus three actually three books and apollo uh apollo 2012 um rising i gotta tell you i can't wait to get my hands on zenith 2016 but we're so glad to have them with us so glad that uh, they're spending time with us. This is important information, critical, life-saving stuff. Steve, going to pop it back to you. Take it. Well, I want to turn it right over to Tom because this is critical. Doug, when we're talking about war, we're talking about supernatural entities that have been in control of esoteric knowledge for literally millennia, even prior to the creation of Adam and Eve. And the adepts, the priests, what I call the Egyptian priesthood, you can call it the brotherhood of death, whatever. But it's critical to understand that when Tom and his research turned up what they turned up, the thing that caused the greatest shock to my system was when talking to the astronomers that Tom interviewed and all these things. This is critical for people to understand. These gentlemen are looking for the return of Lucifer even to the description from uh, prior to the Middle Ages of, of uh, bat-like wings and, and the, the caricatures that we all associate with the devil. Now, saying that, obviously, the Bible teaches he can transform himself in, in, into whatever form and shape, but God ultimately is the one that strips him, and that's why discernment is important. So, Tom, I just want you to take the next, however, 20, 30 minutes, if you want to give it back to me at any point, take a break, and I'll give it right back. But what you are talking about that I ask you to take in now is critical. The coming war... Uh, go ahead and take it wherever you want, my brother, because this is so important tonight because all truth is parallel. We could be at war in the next, and I'm not setting a date, but let's say in the next two weeks, beyond anything we know, with all the call-ups, the positioning, all the worry, the discernment, the collective unease, the, uh, and the mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, that's going on. So will you just take it from here, Tom, and, and, and share the bottom line, your heart, and, you know, not how you arrived at it, because we got to give people a maximum dose of reality. That's an MDOR, okay? <laughs> uh, absolutely, Steve. What I want to do, uh, and thank you for giving me um, this segment or part of this segment to discuss uh, several things. I'll try to be uh, methodical and try to get to the various points, but uh, something big is coming. It does involve the war of wars, and I believe that we're on the precipice of it right now. So I want to... I'm going to tell people about a secret project that's underway to bring about the dreaded mark of the beast. I also want to talk about the stratagems that I believe are going to be used to uh, initiate it. And then ultimately, I want to use that as the precipice to describe the war that is not just going to be a war between good and evil. Uh, well, I guess it is a war between good and evil, but on the surface it might not appear to be because it's also going to include believers against believers, and I'm talking about some of the most well-known Christian ministries in the world that are going to be set against guys like Steve Quayle and Tom Horn. So first of all, uh, yeah, uh, Doug, my new book, Zenith 2016, uh, if you'll remind me after the show, I'll have somebody send that to you. 
it is creating a bit of a stir because it talks about some of this stuff. Now, right now, today, it's creating a stir, of course, because over there on the top of RaidersNewsUpdate.com, it's telling, you know, it's advertising that a hidden anagram that has to do with all this stuff is going to be posted in four days from now. Some, I, I'm going to give somebody $10,000 of my own money. Who in the world thought that was a good idea? <laughs> oh, man. And then some, some shopping <laughs> sprees so people... So people can use that to actually buy some of those preparedness items, all that. But but anyway, I, I don't even want to go into why we did that. But something is coming. To be more specific, something actually already started. And when you read the book, you will find out that it started in the year 2012, but it is ratcheting towards 2016, 2017, 2018. By the way, 2018 is the 70th year anniversary of uh, the uh, uh, of the nation of Israel coming back together, in 1948. Uh, we're going to have blood moons between now and that period of time. Just a, just an enormous amount of prophetic possibilities, uh, and we'll try to go through those as quickly as we can, one at a time. So, um, one interviewer asked me the other day. He read the book, and then he said, "If something really does happen." in 2016, as in the Antichrist is manifest. Now, uh, first of all, people listening to this show, those were his words and not mine. So keep that in mind. But he said, if the Antichrist is made manifest in 2016, what would that mean for 2017? And I'll tell you what I told him, that the, the work I'm doing right now with former police investigator Terry Cook we have in our possession. Um, we're going to make this public soon. It's, uh, we're going to start probably this weekend. A brand new series at Raiders News Update called Beast Tech. We're going to make this information public. Uh, but there is a government plan. Now, this is not conspiracy uh, talk. This is, a, this is a legitimate U.S. government project that is in place right now. And it involves a federally subsidized project in 2017 to implement what can only be thought of as wide-scale human microchipping. Uh, according to the photocopied and transcript information, it's going to be a voluntary procedure. But what is important about this is it also includes language that uh, admits that there could be uh, trigger event, there could be something that would happen that then could eventually cause this program uh, to turn into something that is not voluntary. And uh, so we're, uh, we are going to be talking about that Raiders News Update. I wanted you to be aware of that because I can hear people's thoughts already, and they would be asking themselves, how in the world could a federally mandated you know, microchip or smart tattoo or some other version of the mark of the beast, how could that be uh, employed practically overnight, basically in a heartbeat, uh, in which it then requires everybody to participate in it? Um, uh, let's see, where do I want to go? The, the, that question would be legitimate. Um but I want people yeah, to think. But, okay, I want people to think about this primary question. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, no, Tom. It, it just it just makes me wonder when you, when you had said that when you had made that statement that broad statement that this could be done so quickly and the infrastructure appears there. Man, that got my attention because we talk about this all the time, and and so you know we're waiting with anticipation in terms of how you think this will play out. And I know that Steve has talked about this. And from what I've seen, by the way, uh, on the two different, um, from an investigative viewpoint, what Steve has done and what you've done, man, you're like right, two roads going right down the same path side by side. So go ahead and continue. I, I just wanted to, just to say that, that uh, I'm interested with this, how this is going to happen. Well, I, you know, when I do shows with Steve especially, um, Steve is always, if you listen to him, he is always quoting scripture. He is always backing up what he's talking about in terms of providing biblical exegesis to support uh, his, his own conclusions or his own findings. And so 
um, I would want to ask the same kind of question and tell people to note how, if you ask the question, what kind of a trigger event could occur, maybe soon occur, that would essentially make a 666 mandatory system uh, uh, occur overnight? What in the world could happen? In the book of Revelation, 1316, it says, and he causeth all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. The phrasing in that verse is really important because the Greek verb for causeth is poio, and what it implies is something is suddenly set in motion by the instigator of an event. Now, in this case, of course, it would be the Antichrist, which then triggers others to have to respond to it. In other words, you cannot be a casual observer. Something is triggered, an event occurs, and you have to respond to it. Now, one wonders, when looking at Revelation uh, 13, 16, what could the Antichrist initiate that would result in the majority of the global population making this sudden decision to accept his mark? I mean, it'd have to be something extraordinary, right, to put so much pressure uh, on freedom-loving people around the world, especially you know uh, here in the United States or in Judeo-Christian cultures, to call yeah, so yeah. many of them to lay aside their personal freedoms and their eternal salvation in exchange for this Orwellian society where now the one world government is going to oversee the details of their lives and their liberty is going to be abandoned. Uh, this was always an issue to me. I mean, what in the world could happen, right? Because I cherish the idea of free moral agency. I cherish the idea of of our Constitution and, and Bill of Rights freedoms, which right now, of course, are under assault, uh, not just daily, but hourly. But I've always thought when the, when the Antichrist system comes, this is not going to be an easy test. It's going to necessitate a global-scale incident that then will set in motion what Revelation calls, calls the man of sin's cause. He causeth all. Somehow, something that overwhelms the, orig- the average person's ability to resist receiving the mark of the beast. Um, now, I had a feeling, not to, I'm not going back here, but I had a feeling when the DHS visited me, uh, I had a feeling that I was only one of thousands because... Uh, United States intelligence is aware of, considering something, and it might actually involve a global-scale incident uh, that maybe sooner than most people expect could set in motion um, that event, a far-reaching scenario. So what could it be? Now, there's a lot of prospects, but I want to just give you three really fast uh, possibilities. These are probably things you guys have discussed, and it would be great to have you uh, weigh in on it. Number one would be an EMP or cyber attack, or both. Number two would be a global economic meltdown. Number three, a natural or manufactured global pandemic, uh, the development of which I happen to believe most directly connects to the possibility of the mark of the beast. Of course, it could be all three of those incidents, uh, all at one time. All right, so what could set in motion overnight a reality that would then uh, bring about immediately a beastly system that would bring the world to its knees? For, uh, scenario number one that I mentioned, uh, electromagnetic or a cyber warfare event. How so? Most government uh, experts today uh, in fields of risk mitigation are focused on likely terrorist or, or perhaps enemy state-sponsored scenarios that could take advantage, right, of our aging electrical and water systems infrastructure. For instance, uh, you could either have a false flag event or uh, a rogue nation that could load these so-called defensive missiles with nuclear warheads and launch them as and use them as not, not impact uh, weapons but electromagnetic pulse weapons, HEMPs. Uh, that go off uh, above particular cities. They would target, of course, critical cities where we've got, uh, you know, energy sources, oil and natural gas pipelines, water delivery systems, banking and financial systems. They would target uh, these very particular systems, and they would only need to launch. I mean, they, they could, these guys could just be offshore in a freighter, 
Uh, we've and anybody that thinks, oh, our man, you know, 200 miles offshore of the United States, we've got that stuff so protected. There's no way in the world that anybody could ever get out there and have any of these kind of warheads, you know, that uh, that they've tipped with nuclear weapons, and now. Uh, you know they're 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 going to uh, uh, launch them as multiple electromagnetic pulse weapons, where they're going to go off above particular cities. Never happen. Our security's too good. Well, anybody that believes that doesn't pay very much attention to the news because we are constantly having even even you know even drug runners <laughs> who are bringing these ships into our systems. We are constantly uh, picking up. Submarines, uh, Russia. Just what was it last year, or year before, Steve? Where they had several of their uh, vessels that were only picked up like at the last minute that were uh, encroaching into that 200-mile uh, perimeter. And those uh, ICBMs, they have much further than 200-mile distance capabilities. And the, uh, I was talking to a, a guy in the military, and he said, in military terminology, if what you're talking about, if a nuclear warhead was detonated hundreds of kilometers above the Earth's surface, it'd be known as what he called a HEMP, H-E-M-P, a high-altitude electromagnetic pulse device. Uh, and that device would produce gamma rays that then in turn are converted into EMPs in the mid-stratosphere, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it literally could bring, if they targeted just a few uh, U.S. cities that are well-known energy hubs, it could literally in a flash uh, bring the United States of America to its knees and knock us back into the dark ages. Now, I should also point out that this isn't just Tom Horn's uh, private opinion. There have been warnings issued recently by the U.S. Department of Defense, again, Homeland Security, even President Obama, involving the risk associated with nations like China that are right now testing U.S. electrical infrastructure vulnerability through cyber attacks that are actually aimed at determining how to sabotage our power grid, our financial institutions, even air traffic control systems. That's happening right now. In fact, there was an article uh, recently uh, by F. Uh, Michael Maloff, and every time he writes something, I go there to read it because he was he's a writer for World Net Daily, but he's a former senior security policy analyst uh, from the Office of the Secretary of Defense. And now he's a current, of course, staff writer for World Net Daily and the G2 Bulletin. Uh, uh, Joseph Ferris works over there. But he wrote an article recently, and it was called Sledgehammer of Cyber Warfare, EMP Attack. And let me give you just a quick quote out of this article. Quote, those same adversaries, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, also incorporate in their military doctrine the use of nuclear electromagnetic pulse, or EMP, attack as part of a strategic operation that would basically throw the kitchen sink at the United States. According to Cynthia E. Ayers, uh, who once was the National Security Agency and currently is with the U.S. Army War College, uh, these countries, she said, will hit us with everything – computer viruses, sabotage of critical communication nodes, kinetic strikes on key information systems, and a nuclear EMP attack. The last, an EMP, is their, she said, is their best chance to collapse our national power grid and take us down perhaps permanently, she says, end quote. So in short, this is a scenario, a coordinated assault on America and or our allied nations that's described in this report that could instantly result in the collapse of Western society, as it has been known, and directly thereafter, you know what's going to happen, right? Anarchy fills the street. Martial law is imposed. But what else happens? A national cry fills the air for salvation from chaos. Now, is that a perfect recipe uh, through which the man of sin could step in with wondrous answers to our overnight problems by offering some unknown method for restoring social order. In a minute, I want to get your take on something here, uh, Steve. How could the Antichrist mark those who would be allowed to function in his kingdom following a catastrophic cyber or EMP attack like I just described that would result in widespread damage to essential structures? I mean, that would be the first question, right? Wouldn't electrical 
uh, computerized systems be needed online for these implantable high-tech marks to function uh, at least in any way as we understand them. I I I know uh, in our global uh, in our war college I know that superpowers like the United States we obviously have some kind of top secret response that either is being devised or already has been devised for such an event. But I also know that that's mostly in place really just to protect the president and those who are closest to them. And outside of that, it's going to be every man for himself. But what if something beyond human comprehension is planned by the Antichrist, that that these grids all go down? Now, how can his system function? I'm asking this rhetorical question because I noticed one day that when the Bible describes how this final world leader is going to deceive mankind with lying signs and wonders, Second Thessalonians, and appear at a time when there are fearful sights and great signs from heaven, which we were talking about a moment ago, Luke uh, 21.11, you can't help note that there is something very specific and interesting about the wording in Scripture that implies how the man of sin is going to be directly associated with electricity and people's need of shelter. Um, first of all, the heaven that's mentioned there in Luke twenty-one eleven, fearful sights and great signs from heaven, that's not the throne room of God. It's not talking about the, he- the throne room of God as in that kind of heaven. That's the word oranos, which was also... Uh, known um, as uh, um, the cosmos by uh, ancient Hebrews. This is the the vaulted expanse of the sky, but this is where the clouds and the tempest gather, and specifically for them, it was where electrical energy, where lightning is produced. In fact, they named so many of their deities, Zeus and so many others, as that god that lives in the cosmos, in that area, and they always directly connected him with the ability to produce uh, electrical energy or lightning. Uh, Also recall uh, how in um, Nehemiah 9, remember when the prophet spoke of of, of more than one heaven. Uh, He saw the heaven, but then he saw the heavens of heaven. Uh, Paul comes from that same angle in uh, 2 Corinthians in the New Testament where he says, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago who was caught up to the third heaven. And scholars believe that when Paul was referring to that third heaven, he was talking about his, he was coming from his formal education as a Pharisee concerning these three different heavens, but one that was a domain of error, the cosmos, the oranos, uh, the height that uh, is controlled by Belzebul, the lord of the height, but Belzebul is also the god of electricity, the god of lightning. Now, that was Oranos, or or the cosmos, um, but in the Bible, let me get back to my thoughts here, the, the, both the false prophet and the Antichrist are described as being aligned with the power of that celestial realm from which it says in in Revelation, they are able to call down fire. Now, that could be talking about literal fire, but as some have noted, it also could be talking about electricity. The uh, prophet Daniel tells us that the Antichrist belief system will honor a strange alien god. We talked about that last time in Exo Vaticana, uh, and that he appears related, however, also to electricity. And lightning, uh, Daniel eleven thirty eight thirty nine, in his estate, in the Antichrist place or in his estate, shall he honor the God of fortresses and a God whom his fathers knew not. Shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things? Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. End quote. We talked about some of the parts of that prophecy last time that stand out as very unusual and how it can literally be interpreted as a strange alien god. What we didn't talk about, how, however, is how this phrase, God of forces, uh, also called the God of fortresses, that is directly connected in uh, history to Baal Shaman, uh, who was an ancient deity that was worshipped throughout the Middle East, especially in Canaan and Phoenicia, but also, guys, get this, directly connected to Syria, 
where we are right now trying to fulfill prophecy, um, and this deity uh, was the greatest angel of electrical energy, natural electrical and high voltage discharges. So here's the question I'm, I'm, I guess I'm asking. Could it imply that the Antichrist could come on the world overnight like some supernatural version of Nikola Tesla? with some wonder-creating wireless electricity transmission system capable of repowering the world. I know in the beginning that sounds astonishing, but you have to think of what will it take for the Antichrist to bring basically the world to its knees and to, and to cause all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond. Um, oh, I probably should say here real quick, for those who don't know who the inventor Nikola Tesla was... <laughs> Uh, he was an electrical engineer. He was known all around the world. He patented all these kind of devices. Uh, he had tremendous knowledge of uh, alternating current, AC, electrical supply systems. But before he died in the 1940s, he actually intended a proof-of-concept demonstration of the very kind of thing that I'm discussing now, an intercontinental system that would provide uh, transatlantic wireless power transmissions for electricity, telephones, broadcasting, and some believe he would have accomplished it, but his project was defunded, misdream, because, well, pressure was brought on, and some believe by skullduggery involving um, electricity contracts from his competitor, who he once worked for, uh, but Thomas Edison's General Electric Company. So there was some skullduggery. It defunded his big tower project. But he was going to illustrate wireless electrical intercontinental ability. So could the Antichrist uh, come in uh, in that way? Uh, and, and before I get your answer, also note just one final thing, how that the Hebrew word translated forces there in Daniel is Maot, but that refers to a deity, a deity that can provide human protection in the form of strong housing or uh, places of safety, refuge, protection. But it adds to this question whether the Antichrist could appear as a false savior of humanity immediately following a wide-scale cyber attack or EMP-type event that brings down national power grids and leaves people uh, desperate for common necessities like electricity and housing. I just find it very interesting that when you start looking into the Hebrew and Greek language describing the appearance of the Antichrist, there are numerous and redundant references that connect him to electricity. And uh, so it is, it, is, it is one of several possibilities uh, I'd like to get your feedback on that because it's something that's been on my mind a lot. And then I'll talk about a couple of other that people may more easily be able to wrap their minds around. Well, I would I would like to address that one issue because, look, we know from the basis of Hegel, the Hegelian dialectic, you create the problem, you provide the solution, and in providing the solution, you bring about the change. When the lights go out in the city and things have turned real, you can fill in the word with that, People will do anything because darkness is more, how do I say this, darkness not only uh, scares people, a lot of people just don't like the dark, but, and they're uncomfortable with it, but the scripture talks about that, here you go, Tom, the time, Jesus' word, for the day comes when no man can work. With a cyber attack, with the potential for uh, a complete shutdown of the electrical grid, and I'm talking intentional, and by the way, it's Nicholas Tesla, T-E-S-L-A, okay? I'm only right. saying that because because Tesla, as some people say, but they look it up, and, and to, for those who want to go and check it out, uh, I, I, I wrote about Tesla. By the way, Stan Dale uh, went to um, Tesla's laboratory and understands Tesla physics, I would say, as well as anybody. But the people that inherited, just a quick aside, the people that really took Tesla seriously with those tele-geodynamics and the ability to basically create death rays, etc. He basically stated he could literally destroy the earth by achieving the right harm harmonic, in other words, split it. And what he was really saying is he could split the atom by using harmonics. And, and when fission moved from just a bombardment with a uh, high explosive to laser uh, fission and laser fusion, then light became 
that which could detonate. Interesting. It, let me share this, and this will answer. Probably the greatest discovery, I think, in theoretical physics took place, or at least announced, on the 17th. And did you see that? In, uh, the physicists have discovered a jewel-like geometric object that dramatically simplifies calculations of particle interactions and challenges the notion that space and time are fundamental components of reality. This is interesting. It is called, you ready for this? It is called an amplituhedron. Amplituhedron. And it looks like a diamond. And it looks like facets are almost, it looks like what's called a Munsell color chart. Or you could even see those paint charts where everything blends into everything. In other words, obviously we're talking about string theory. But going beyond that, the idea of controlling electricity. See, the ancients did possess electricity. And by the way, Barack Obama, Barack is another word for lightning, okay? Mm -hmm. And remember mm -hmm. this, when Scripture, Jesus said he saw uh, uh, Lucifer fall like, or I beheld, fall like lightning that's the word we're talking about and the word lightning and even jesus uses the word lightning because people he says as the lightning goes from the what east to the west so will the son of the time of the son of man so when the devil is a copycat he's going to try and assimilate through technology that he and his adepts and the non-human intelligence the fallen angels and their earthly spawn okay Control. They're going to use that to technologically deceive mankind. So, Tom, what you're saying there, and here's where it gets interesting, the sounds, if you take sound, remember in the book of Genesis, and God said, let there be light. So the, the verse of, of sound, if you will, and all these sounds, I maintain that every sound that we are hearing, seeing, uh, experiencing, uh, and, and that people are plugged in their iPods or whatever, iPhones, I this music, I that music, this is fundamentally altering the created, uh, if you will, thinking capabilities of the brain that God gave us in our free will, and I do believe he gave us free will. You can't have the word choose and deny free will. The point is, and I got one guy that always sends me emails, there is no such thing as free mail. He's wrong, he's wrong, he's wrong. <laughs> The bottom line is, is that we're seeing now technology. The ancients possessed a knowledge of electricity. And I even posted from uh, Epic Times, the editor sent me a story about how the ancient South, America, uh, South Americans could literally almost uh, liquefy rock. Did you see that article? I did um, not. Okay. I did so not. What we're what we're talking about, you're, you're proposing a, a, a question, I'm answering the question. Absolutely, will angel tech, fallen angel technology, I once had a general, special operations tell me, pretty much, Steve, every, every operation is to find the ancient technology and its weaponry and to be able to use it by those in authority to destroy humanity. And he said, my job these are the guys I called mighty men and women of valor, is to keep that kind of stuff from falling into their hands. And that's a good thing that there are still people out there. But again, the whole, if you will, the whole vibrational frequency, all of that which God put into place as barriers is being accosted, attacked, it's being sublimated, it's being taken apart, and so therefore, it's almost like, if you will, the sonic barriers, the light barriers that once kept the powers of darkness at bay are now being uh, messed with. Harp is nothing more than one of 72 ionospheric heaters. There are 72 goetic demons, the goetic gates. Interesting enough, there are 72 imams and 72 virgins. Well, what's fascinating to me about all this stuff, we're talking about an end-time recipe for technological magic, and, and that magic will be applied to deceive people. So instantaneously, if the world, Tom, is put into a blackout for three days, some guy comes on the scene, can give us the free energy we all know already exists, then I think people are going to fall down, worship him, kiss his feet, and other parts of his uh, anatomy. I think they're going to, and, and some people say, that's very offensive. Well, I got news for you. If you want to see offense, 
figure out and factor in five and a half billion people. So when you start to concern yourself with that, ladies and gentlemen, then you can take issue with the smallest minutia that would trip anybody. And, and I say this, Tom, because what you and I are talking about, can I say this? And here's a good term for tonight. We'll claim it tonight, okay? We are talking about quantum madness being interjected into our reality to destroy uh, marvelously, as the scripture says, and to make war on the saints. I hope I've answered your question. Oh, and, and, and so much more than I could have even imagined. The fact that I would put you on the spot and you would have that just in your head illustrates why you're Steve Quayle and I'm Tom Horn. But Steve, did we get a preview earlier this year uh, of an entity that has supernatural Tesla, and thank you for correcting I probably said it backwards, Tulsa or something stupid. Yes, you did, but but, but yeah, it's I'm important sorry, so no one will take you on. So he doesn't even yeah. know the guy. I mean, I get that. If I say the wrong word, trust me, it's like the entire dictionary criticana of critics, that's another word, is thrown. So I'm just trying to save you the headache of having to deal I get, with that. I, 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 I get around you and Gary Stearman, and then I just want to pack my bags and go home anyway. <laughs> well, I got news for you. Then we'd be there waiting for you because we get around you and we go, what does Tom have to say? So, oh, but, really? and listen, that's to the glory of God. Can I tell everybody something? This isn't a mutual embrace of each other's, right. uh, you know, cheeks. This is, and I'm sorry, that's offensive to some people. Who cares? The people that everything's offensive to don't get offended by the the factors that are we're talking about tonight. Tom, we're talking about. Jesus said there's never been a time like it, nor will be again. And except the days be short, there be no flesh left alive. And, and, you know, when I talk about molecular dissemblers, and we talk about everything from uh, from phasers and all the words that you hear in uh, science fiction are already adopted by the scientific, what I call black science or what Russ calls black physics, these Entities know how to control mankind. Look at if 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 everything is on an iPad or in the uh, uh, voiceover infrasonic realm on your television, and you're being continually programmed, then critical thinking has gone out the door. Entertainment and continual drowning out the sounds. By the way, I posted something that everyone must read on my website about the 2,700. The satellites that their 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 purpose beyond just their military application is to literally bombard the airwaves to take away the beautiful harmony, the beautiful symphony, the clear channel sounds of God's wonderful voice in creation. I got news for you. If all creation sings an exaltation of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, then I can I can say this, it must drive the devil nuts that he has to, you know, he use heavy metal and I'm not a heavy metal fan to drown out the pure voice the lovely voice of creation. And I'm telling you this, that's going to be a chapter in in something I'm writing, okay? There's a giveaway. <laughs> well, what had taken my mind back to to all of this, you know, the Hebrew and Greek uh, connections to Antichrist uh, as somehow being connected to uh, electrical power and lightning, what, what originally kind of, you know, made me go back and do that was how early this year in February, lightning struck St. Peter's Basilica twice immediately following the resignation of Pope Benedict the 16th, and now, that may have been a coincidence. It might not have meant uh, anything to um, other people. Uh, but uh, I couldn't help but think the timing of those two lightning bolts uh, on that particular building at Vatican City at that exact time uh, was fairly mathematically uh, improbable, especially kind of being a student of Roman myth and how uh, their omens – uh, had everything in the world to do with lightning and the god of lightning and the god of electricity who would show his approval of the new leader of an institution or a country, which is actually where we take the word inaugurate because we took that from the Roman augurs who would approve. Uh, and, and also, Steve, it wasn't just the lightning. It was also the sound. It was thunder and lightning that was the most important auspice a sign from Jupiter, the father of uh, of Apollo, the Zeus, Zeus being the uh, Greek version, that he was uh, watching and that he approved. And anyway, that kind of took my mind back 
to this whole idea, and I wondered, you know, why why would the Antichrist be associated with electricity and lightning? And then you get to watching these uh, experts out there right now who are staying up at night concerned that, uh, well, it's probably far more fragile than the American citizen needs to know as to how that could happen in the blink of an eye and literally take us back into the dark ages. Uh, now, say one final thing about this, because I know I, I want to make these other two points really fast so I don't spend this much time. But when you look at the appearance of the beast and the Antichrist in the book of Revelation, there's another thing that could be connected to this in that it seems to preface the moment uh, of, the, uh, of that moment when the Antichrist uh, initiates his beastly system. It seems to preface it with some kind of a military attack that results in the destruction or the death, if you will, uh, and then seemingly miraculous, rapid recovery of what many, uh, many expositors believe is both the man and the global superpower that he represents. Um, so when you look at that premise, you have the healing of a man and or the nation, either by himself or both, uh, the healing of that, uh, of that deadly wound. And uh, and it causes all the world, it says, to worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast and to proclaim who is like unto the beast and who is able to make war with him. So some type of military event occurs that leads to some type of death, both of, uh, both of the man and or the supernation he represents, and it seems to be so rapidly resolved. I mean, the lights just suddenly come back on, and the whole world stands back, and they marvel, and they say, who is like him? And then it goes right back into the same kind of text. It's followed by a vision of power and fire from the heavens, connected to the implementation of the mark of the beast. He doeth great wonder, so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and he deceives them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles. And the text just goes on and on and immediately leads to, and then he causes all, both small and great. Those are all right in Revelation 13, 4 through 18, just one line right after the other, uh, where you have that connection between what appears to be the god of electricity, something catastrophic happens literally overnight. They're back on their feet again, and all the world marvels and specifically says, who is like them and who can make war with them? So that's one possibility. Let me just give you a couple more really fast. What could happen overnight that could set in motion the implementation of the mark of the beast? Um, a second scenario is the collapse, of, uh, the collapse of the global economy. And this is something that we all know right now. We are standing, I mean, we're kicking the stones over the edge of the precipice right now. And recently, uh, the United States National Intelligence Council, the NIC, working with the European Union's Institute for Security Studies, they joined forces. And it's an interesting study uh, to produce an assessment of the long-term prospects for global governance frameworks. In essence, you could look at their report as they're, they're essentially saying, what could set in motion the need for a global government? Well, that that is identical to what could set in motion the need for the end-time institution of the Antichrist, a global government. Their report's called Global Governance 2025 at a Critical Juncture. People can Google that and download the PDF and read it for themselves. It was written by the top intelligence agency of the United States, working with the top intelligence agencies of Europe. And what they're doing is they're assessing the leading um, intercontinental perils that could endanger the collective administration or the global governance of things that are important to all of us, all of us at an international level. But from the very beginning of their report, there's a subsection called Scenario One, Barely Keeping Afloat. Uh, and in that, they acknowledge how crisis, um, including the current financial institutions of the world, are being served what they call ad hoc temporary frameworks that are devised to avert the most threatening aspects. In other words, such as the United States printing money for which we have no gold reserves, we're in the red, we don't produce enough revenue 
to even pay the bill. So we're going deeper in debt every single day. And just this week, we're going to raise the ceiling once again. And uh, uh, and the president's out there saying things about it. People are talking about it. But if you read Global Governance 2025, brighter minds are saying these are synthetic economic tricks. They're only temporarily sustaining what is ultimately an unsustainable financial system that at any moment. In fact, Many experts in the field are astonished, right, that we've even made it this far. I mean, they've been predicting uh, around the world, uh, we're talking experts in the field, predicting a devastating crash for the stock market. They're hoping it won't happen, but they know that history, experience, the facts available today, uh, they know that everything's being artificially sustained, and that is, is only a matter of time before this house of cards crumbles. Now, more conspiratorially, or perhaps, perhaps I should say more accurately and transparently, some people suggest that something sinister in that regard is actually being planned. In other words, a global stock market crash for the near future that is intentional, that we are right where we are because there is an ordo ab chao that has intentionally been set in motion by the Illuminatus and their cohorts, and that ultimately, in a flash, what could happen overnight that could bring the world to its knees so that it could, so that a an antichrist system could be implemented what could happen they believe that instantly what happens thousands of banks literally within 36 hours or less are closed all around the world they've seized most people's personal assets they confiscate gold and silver if they can find it eliminate cash all of this all of this is already being illustrated in other countries right now where banks essentially say it was your money yesterday it's ours today that could happen uh in the United States right now we're pay, we're taking people's retirement dollars it doesn't belong to the fed but they're taking it it can happen in one day especially if you have a federally sanctioned declared emergency that's activated by a presidential executive order. Now, I'm not trying to frighten nobody. I'm just telling you, get a grip on the kind of reality that we are living in today. Because after the financial institutions of the world crumble, if they do, it would be a snap for a worldwide monetary system to it's be restructured into one. Yeah, Tom, if I can chime in here, uh, this is Doug Hagman. Uh, as Steve and uh, V, the Agrilla economist, had come on uh, several times over the past several months, and you opened the program, both you and uh, uh, Tom, you and Steve, we were talking about Syria a little bit with respect to the geopolitical nature of things. Out of the three and I know we have not gotten to number three yet, but out of the three scenarios that you mentioned, my investigation, being a student, and I use this respectfully, of both you and Steve, looking at uh, Steve's uh, research and what he's done and, Tom, your research and what you've done, I, I've got to say this. The war in Syria, to me, uh, based on, on – on the research I've concluded in my context, my military and intelligence context, is being done at the orders of the Illuminati. We are actually, the United States is really a captured operation, working on the, at the behest of the Saudis, of the Qataris, at, the, um, at that level, and the behind it, those people are the international bankers. If we go hot, not, well, I shouldn't say if, when we go hot with Syria, and we will, because that is the, that objective has never changed, although I believe Pastor Langford and Steve and our programs, as well as other alternative media exposés, have pushed back the timetable. When that Syrian war goes hot, the, the regional chaos will turn into a global conflict that will affect the oil, the energy, the energy and the only thing that the U.S. dollar is backed by is the free flow of energy. It's not backed by gold or silver or anything other tangible element except the promise of oil, the promise of energy, the promise of unfettered access to that energy to the West. Overnight, and this is about the only thing that really makes sense to me, overnight we could see um, just the Syrian situation give way to a banking collapse, banking holiday 
the killing off of the dollar, not a collapse, I should say, but a, 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 an intentional murdering of the dollar, as Timothy Geithner expressed to Kyle Bass back in 2010, which was their intent, gone is the petrodollar, and then in order to buy, sell, barter, exchange, whatever, there must be some level of a consistency, which will be the mark of the beast. So in other words, it'll be the hunger, fright, cold, lack of shelter, lack of food, lack of water that will bring people to that point. But it's going to be a cascading, the result of a cascading, quickly cascading event to bring us to that point. I, I just wanted to throw that in there. I think, Doug, let me interrupt here because yeah. that is as concise and clear, by the way, well done, and and absolute definitive understanding. I want to say something. V is going on uh, coast to coast 924 next week, and he's going to cover this stuff. And for those of you that don't know V, he's a financial analyst. He, he, he is by, uh, and this is not flattery, he is a genius. He has been prescient and prophetic. And uh, the point is, is he's going to be on with George Norrie on 924, I think for the whole show, or at least a couple hours. So I want everyone to listen to him. But what he basically sent me today, somebody had asked, well, well, it, why was he talking about October? You just said something powerful, Doug. If people are not, how should I say this, believing that God is answering the collective prayer and the collective time of fasting that we've done on Hagman and Hagman worldwide, then they are blind to the hand, the staying hand of evil that God has been so gracious to grant us because they are going to kill the dollar. It's going to be instantaneous. And we've already seen reverse hypothecation. Let me just make that really simple. You can just steal anything that's put into a bank because a bank no longer owes you money. In essence, your money becomes theirs, and they've changed terms. So they've set up the legal precedent. Now, Jesus said the love of money is the root of all evil. What I've been trying to do for 20 years, not more than that now, uh, you know, forgive me, 20 years on talk radio, 42 years uh, since I got saved mar miraculously by the mercy of the living God, is to get people to understand the whole realm of finance. I've been at this a long time. And what most people don't recognize, and this is what Tom is giving his scenarios, is, is that when you control the money, you control the flow of life. It doesn't matter. You can put any commodity. Now, what Christians have been trying to do and doing, I think, and, and the ones that are listening, is that they're, they're trying to get out of harm's way. Tom, if Tom, what Tom is saying is one of the three scenarios, I'd submit to you, I believe they'll integrate them all. I do, and yeah. that's my statement. Don't get mad at Tom Horn. Obviously, you know, I'm making that statement. An EMP, obviously. that would. And, and prior to the EMP, let's say we know this, you guys. Let's say right now in, in Montana, my computer says 757. Let's say I just get an email, and it's from the most powerful banking group in the world. And they said, at 8 o'clock, we're going to literally initiate a high-altitude electromagnetic pulse, or we're going to do this, that, or the other thing. And in a keystroke, I can empty every account in the United States prior to that, get it transferred through all the transfers. I'm just saying they could take it five minutes, five hours, five, five, whatever. It wouldn't, wouldn't be five days. It would be probably less than 30 minutes. That can be initiated. Now, one of the things that V knows is he knows the guys that developed the most sophisticated computer monitoring, uh, mo money uh, monitoring software in the world. He rubs shoulders with those guys. Some of them are his best friends, being as one of the head analysts for the, one of the biggest banks in the world for a number of years, four years ago. And he left it because he couldn't stand the corruption. He is a believer. And God is raising him up to be not only a voice of reason, but I, I would say this, a fourth teller of events coming. He is telling people what's going to happen. When we told people years and years ago that this was going to happen to their IRAs, KEOs, 401Ks, defined benefit plans, and anything, uh, somebody once said, remember this, if, any, if, if the government gives you a tax break, it's only to steal it later. So yeah. the point is, is that we're, we're watching now the language, the legislation, 
and the mindset to steal what used to be considered uh, uh, the holy grail, in other words, a bank deposit insured by the FDIC, it's pretty tough to insure something that doesn't exist in reality, but overnight, and Tom, I don't know, you know, uh, the progression that you believe it will happen, but let's say everything, and when we get to point three, you can fill that in, but imagine the stuff all happening at once. We will be plundered. Those who are smart and have purchased metals, and Tom said it, do I believe they'll go for silver and gold? I believe they're coming for your life. I believe they're coming for your genes, not just your blue genes, but you know your genetic makeup. I believe the plan is to settle or set into motion so much confusion that everything from your being to your possessions becomes their possession. And your children, in case people don't know this, I put up an alert on my website that supposedly from those in government, FEMA has purchased enough 72-hour kits for every kid in every public school in America. Why do you think that is? Because they will force the kids into the buses, take them to the camps, and then the kids will be used as hostages against their parents. They'll also be sold into slavery. When I make statements like that, people say, oh, that's so gloomy, that's so doomy. That is so far uh, into the realm of the worst-case scenario that it's not only plausible, it's what I'm being told by people in government that this is the plan. So we're there, and so, Tom, I just submit when we come back, you can deal with the third one, but I want you to deal when we come back with the war in the Catholic Church because you guys really call this, and not just picking on the Catholics, because that's not the point, but to demonstrate the fact that it's all set in motion because, you know, we're seeing the complete abrogation, denial of Jesus Christ, putting as much distance between the commands of the living God for his creation and substituting in moral relativism. That is a, not only a recipe for disaster, but that is the devil's banquet table that he has prepared for those he is getting ready to destroy. Go ahead, Don. Well, Steve, and, and I guess we're going to go to a break, and I'll get on that. As soon as we come back, I'll take it where you, where you asked me to take it. But what I would quickly say before the break is that people – um, who think you may be exaggerating the realities by talking about uh, the government coming in and gathering children and putting them, uh, you know, on buses or trains and taking them to potential camps. If they think that can't happen, then they know very, very little about history, including fairly recent history in World War uh, II with what, the Nazi, uh, with what Nazi Germany did. So it's not just feasible it's a piece of history, and what's that famous statement about those who, you know, forget the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them? Fascinating hour, and it went by so fast with our very special guests, Tom Horn and Steve Quayle. We'll be right back after these short messages for our third and final hour. Stay with us. Uh, you're not going to want to miss this. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to our third and final hour of the Hagman the Hagman Report. I want to say a special hello to Sophia, uh, listening out just outside of Rome, Italy. Uh, say hello to Karen for us while you're there. Also listening live is Peter from Manchester. That's in England. And, of course, uh, welcome all of you listening all across the United States, Canada, throughout the rest of the world. You're listening to the Hagman and the Hagman Report, where we push back the agenda of the Illuminati, the satanic agenda that they are forcing upon us, and of course, hacking them off immensely, which delights me more than anything. And, and, two, and two, of the most, uh, two of the most adept at doing this, uh, the tip of the spear, T, uh, Steve Quayle from stevequayle.com and Tom Horner. Of course, RaidersNewsUpdate.com. Uh, I just gotta, I, I just gotta tell you, it's, it's such a pleasure to have you both with us tonight, and uh, bringing the larger truth. This is stuff you're not going to hear elsewhere. And it, also, folks, by the way, if you haven't done so, uh, Steve Quayle was on Coast to Coast AM earlier in the week. Definitely catch the replay on that. Uh, and folks, Tom Horn has got just such a magnificent uh, website with all sorts of multimedia presentations. Grab his books as well. You won't be sorry. Uh, welcome back, gentlemen, to the third and final hour. Tom, we're going to kick it back to you uh, right where you left off. Uh, listen, and I want to say uh, for people that were listening to that last hour that um, 
I'm afraid that what you, Doug, and what you, Steve, were saying about the possibility of a financial collapse and the um, possibility that events um, any time now, really, tonight, before the show's over, could cascade sooner than um, later, it's a present reality. And it's a high possibility uh, that this could conclude in a worldwide monetary system that then is going to be restructured into one that provides more efficient methods of total enslavement, right? Uh, what was it you were saying, Doug? You you enjoy teasing off the Illuminati. <laughs> but and, and, and it's what we're doing tonight, but we know that they have a plan, uh, that they are setting the stage for the official establishment of the Antichrist final new world economic order, and that's what Scenario 2 uh, is about. And just so you guys know, I, 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 I wrote down these three scenarios uh, in bullet points just before the show, and I put them together in a way that they escalate. In other words, the second one to me is more likely than the first one. The third one is more likely than, than the second one. Um, but I also had intended to make a point that Steve made just before uh, we went to the break that, that in all reality what I expect is that any number of or all three of these events are going to happen all at the same time. So it's going to be three times as bad as any one of these given uh, scenarios that bring the world to its knees and that implement an antichrist system. And I believe that a manufactured crash could begin. Um, well, it could it could start in any country, Japan, some other country, but then it's going to work its way around the globe very quickly, as you were talking about before the break, uh, Doug. It's going to topple the economies of nations. Literally, what we're seeing, like a like a string of dominoes, right? And virtually, simultaneously, uh, all of the economic major economic systems of the world on which people have have uh, depended are going to uh, come to the ground. Now, it's on the heels of that event because the question was, what event could be set in motion? that then allows practically overnight the implementation of an antichrist system that also includes the mark of the beast. Well, on the events of a total global economic meltdown, which it's not Tom Horn, the a prophecy writer, or Steve Quayle, the prophecy writer, or Doug Hagman and Joe Hagman, the Hagman and Hagman Report, or uh, people who are con you know constantly called uh, conspiracy Theory. We're talking about the the brightest minds in the world today that that are people who do work in banking and industry or who have. These are people that have traded on Wall Street. These are guys with qualified uh, credentials that are saying, "Ladies and gentlemen, we are astonished that we've made it this far. At any moment, this house of cards is going to come down. And when it does, what I'm saying is a new form of." digital currency, something like that, could be announced. It's already being talked about. It'd be international in scope. It's going to be heralded as being more reliable, right, than the old monetary system. But it's going to replace, and we can all see that we're going there. It's going to replace modern credit cards, debit cards, paper checks. We're already doing it. We're already paving the way for a super biometric ID system or a smart tattoo or a biochip implant wherein every financial transaction in a person's life is going to be stored, cataloged, analyzed, accessed for future reference by New World Order bureaucrats. And for the majority of people listening to this program, they know what I'm saying is true because they're already using electronic banking, direct payroll deposits, direct deposits of Social Security checks, automatic uh, you know, ATMs, credit and debit cards, electronic automatic payment of their bills. So for the world, it's not going to be hard to accept a, this kind of a new system. It's going to be a snap. What's more, and this is something, again, maybe in a moment you guys can weigh in on, polls around the world, have you seen this lately, that show overwhelmingly today that a majority of people uh, not only appreciate, but they approve the convenience of emerging biometric and smart banking technologies, that, that people are open now to this very near future reality wherein their flesh is merged with apparati for buying, 
selling surveillance. Now, this is ultimately going to happen, what, maybe maybe an implantable chip, but there could be some other cool new cyborg control system. But we can see this right now, that people are already wearing headsets. They're doing brain-machine interfacing. The new iPhone, what, number five or whatever just came out with a biometric fingerprint system. The world is celebrating this technology. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, Steve, uh, you know, I just I just said some other cool new cyborg control system. Uh, speaking of that, that Global Governance 2025 at a critical juncture document that talks about how we're living on the, the very edge right now, uh, the, the, the document that I cited in hour two, you should get that and read it because they also combine the risk of a global financial collapse and in one of their uh, one of their elements in which they see that happening, one of their scenarios, they see the global financial collapse as triggered by biological weapons. Uh, Doug, it's what you and and uh, Steve, it's what you were saying in the second hour and before the break that any one of these things happens, it's like a trigger event, and it causes all of the other events that we're talking about to happen. Well, that's what the Global Governance 2025 says, that a biological weapon could potentially be released. It's going to trigger a financial collapse. It sets in a collapse. It sets that in motion. But but go there and read pages 35 and so on when they're talking about how this, uh, this trigger uh, brings about the collapse of the finances and biological weapons. And read how they include in that assessment how biotech could also eventually lead to a new form of man, a cyborg form of man who's better integrated to uh, deal with the realities of digital banking. And then they even go on to talk about, however, how that new digital form of man itself becomes a risk because now it's a unique physical, emotional, cognitive ability that emerges as a result of these of these trigger events, but then becomes a risk itself to humanity. Now, let me uh, let me remind people, go to Google, type in Global Governance 2025 at a critical juncture, and keep in mind, this was written by the lead intelligence uh, agencies of the United States and Europe. So we're not talking about, you know, weekly world news here. Uh, yep. These these guys are leaders in risk uh, 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 mitigation and management, and and let me sh let me read to you just a, a brief excerpt from page 35, where these U.S. and European intelligence leaders transition from the threat of a biological weapon and the collapse of the economy to potentially dangerous new forms of man. The reason I want to do this is because it will bring us to scenario three, which will bring us full circle and bring us back to uh, Steve's book, uh, True Legends, and what we had started out talking about. Listen to what these guys say. This is astonishing. Quote, page 35, quote, No forum currently exists for dealing comprehensively across the scientific community, industry, and government on measures needed to diminish the risk posed by the biotechnology revolution, the development of new agents and the expansion of access to those with hostile intentions increase the bioterrorism threat. In addition, biotechnology, which the OECD thinks will potentially boost the GDPs of its membership, can drive new forms of human behavior and association, creating profound cross-cultural ethical questions that will be increasingly politically contentious. Few experts believe that current governance instruments are adequate for those challenges. For example, direct modification of DNA at fertilization is widely researched with a goal of removing defective genes. However, discussions of future capabilities open the possibility for designing humans with unique physical, emotional, or cognitive abilities, end quote. Do you see what they did there? They went right from the possibility of a bioterrorism event that then causes a cascading collapse of the monetary systems of the world that leads to a new kind of digital system, if you will, and they made this whole leap of judgment in how 
that itself is going to set in motion the very things that Steve Quayle and Tom Horn have been talking about, <laughs> you know, for the last decade. Bio-enhanced humans with unique cognitive abilities uh, that have been in the design budgets and on the drawing board of military strategists and social engineers for some time who imagine how man's growing marriage with and dependence on machine intelligence is in the not-too-distant future uh, going to accompany almost everything that we do, including buying and selling. I found that to just be astonishing how these guys before I did actually coupled uh, scenario two with scenario uh, three, uh, scenario three, and uh, and of course we we believe that that era has started. I'm talking about the hybridization of mankind, the cyborgization of mankind. Those who will be more readily equipped for an antichrist system. Um, it's in its embryonic. Uh, stage but it's already been given a name it's called the hybrid age people can go to google and type in the hybrid age just read all about it look at these atheists agnostics these high-tech geeks if you will that are writing about this right now and look at the persons that they are describing as tomorrow's humanity uh and yeah hybrid age sounds exactly i mean is exactly what it sounds like we are going to do to humans, what we're already doing with genetically modified crops and transgenic animals and human-animal chimeras, at least at the embryonic stage, but now I think I have evidence that we're doing it beyond the em embryonic stage, but be that what it is, we intend to do that to the rest of humanity in general. We're going to hybridize man via genetic alterations, nanotech, synthetic bio, uh, human tech integration with artificial intelligence and brain-machine interfaces uh, systems. Uh, we're moving that direction, but the role that it will play with the birth of the mark of the beast, I just found that to be absolutely incredible that our intelligence agencies here and in Europe, when they came together and said, what could set in motion the birth of, an, uh, uh, of a global government that they included, the emergence of a new form of humanity. Just astonishing, right? Well, I think uh, also, yeah. Tom, I want to I chime in here, Doug. The Antichrist, obviously we know three components. Now, we've dealt with two. I, I want to just take you, if I can get you ten minutes, Tom, with the new announcement by the Pope, okay, that atheists can go to heaven with the destructuring of even basic Catholic doctrine with the and, and the abrogation of the issue on abortion and homosexuality. The fact is is that you and you primarily, and then Chris, obviously in your 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 co-authoring of uh, you know Exo Vaticana. But the point is is that now we are seeing. Uh, how do I say this? We're seeing this man who who you know obviously his background and all that. I'm not asking you to comment on that, but how do you see those announcements over the last week as facilitating what I believe is the merging one world religion, one world uh, body politic, and one world economic? And let nobody, dis, uh, how do I say this, deny this. If people understood the realm that the Vatican plays and the financial underpinnings of the world, I was fortunate for two years to have hired a, quote, consultant, who is one of the biggest spooks that ever lived within the agency's walls. And when I was told about what really went on in that world, it was so uh, jaw-dropping that, quite candidly, it took me weeks to, to come to grips with some of this stuff. So where do you see the Pope, specifically, Tom? I'm not trying to take you away, but I want you to a a a you know, answer that, because you guys are the ones that, that said, hey, the, the former Pope's going to resign. You guys are on record, and you were proven right. And then, obviously, people were fighting, complaining, uh, griping, uh, you know, other words about, well, who is a black pope? This guy's not a black pope, blah, blah, blah. So where are we in that whole thing? Because I think people really need to hear that, Protestants as well as Catholics. Well, um, let me say some stuff about that, and then I'll try to come back uh, to this other issue, because at the end of this uh of the third point that I want to make, the third scenario, I actually bring it back to the church and the potential of a war that's going to unfold within the church. But to kind of jump off onto the side here for a moment, um, I've been pretty, I, I shouldn't even say that I've been astonished, 
because I've expected that this pope would definitely do things and that he would initiate things that would ultimately lead to um, you know, a new world order. If, in fact, the prophecy of the popes can be believed, if, in fact, we are living in the end times, if, in fact, he is going to be the false prophet, um, then, of course, he's going to play some role in initiating a kind of new world order. But if people study the scriptures, they'll know that both the false prophet and the Antichrist, they come in as deceivers, right? They don't come, the, the false prophet and the Antichrist, neither one of them are going to stand up day one and say, by the way, I am the destroyer of worlds, <laughs> right? It, it's, it's a form of deception. They make the world love them. And look at this pope right now. Uh, he stands up against Obama. Uh, on the whole Syrian issue. And Obama is embarrassed. Obama is red-faced. America, uh, you know, is now taking kind of second seat to the leader of Russia and people like that. But they're, but they're also being overshadowed by this new pope. And the new pope is being heralded, wh what? As a man of peace. Anybody that knows Scripture, anybody that knows how both the false prophet and the Antichrist will come to power ought to have uh, the hair standing up on the back of their neck. Because right now, involving Syria, which is central to biblical prophecy, to the, to the end of biblical prophecy, uh, 30, what is it, 33% recent polls in the last week show not just church attenders, 33% of Americans believe that we might be living in the end times now. That's absolutely astonishing because there's something below the surface. They recognize something's going on, but then here's this guy, right? He's lovable. They love him. He's talking about the grace of God, and he's talking about the grace of God for everybody. It doesn't matter if you're gay. It doesn't matter if you're an atheist, right? The grace of God stems to you. Uh, you know, the world is going to love this guy, and they do love him. He's the front cover of Time magazine. He's the front cover of Newsweek magazine. Uh, but when we were studying the prophecy of the popes, we unanimously came to the conclusion that the title Petrus Romanus, Peter the Roman, was symbolic. Now we said it'd be it'd be you know be really cool if uh, like uh, you know uh, uh, Bertone, Peter the Roman, the Secretary of State, became the Pope. I mean that would be an astonishing fulfillment. But we wrote in our book two years before the event that we really didn't believe that was what was going to happen. We kind of agreed with the the Belgian. Jesuit René Thibault, remember him? He predicted 61 years in advance, 61 years in advance, the month that Gloria Olive Benedict would step down and allow for the arrival of Petrus Romanus. He was part of what influenced us to also say we believed that in uh, April 2000, we said this a, uh, a year and a half in advance, we believed that uh, Benedict would step down uh, around April 2012, allowing for the arrival of Petrus Romanus. Also, Doug, you and Steve will remember that it was on your show, and this was only like 10 or 15 days. I forget what the exact time was, but it was just little over a week before Benedict turned in his resignation that I was on your show, and I said that the resignation of Pope Benedict is imminent. And the reason I remember that, by the way, is because when just a few days later Benedict turned in his resignation, I was getting contacted from people all over the world, including media from Rome, who wanted to know who our insider was <laughs> at the Vatican. And I laughingly, uh, Doug, I laughingly said if I told them it was the Holy Spirit, then they would really be confused, right? Um, but... But we did that on your show, and yeah. uh, and did that with uh, and t being interviewed by uh, Steve at that time. Uh, That's right. We said that it was imminent, and then shortly thereafter he stepped down. Well, now um, we had thought, uh, okay, he. Well, first of all, we got one thing right that is really historic. We believed that this would be the first pope in 600 plus years to do so. He's the first one in modern history. To resign because popes don't resign because they're sick, right? They die in office. That's what they do. But we said that he would, and we believe there were reasons that he would, and that he would uh, open the door for the coming of the final pope on that list, but also a pope who could be the false prophet of end times biblical fame. What we found out, however, shortly thereafter, 
was he actually officially resigned right when we said that he would. The New York Times interviewed a spokesman for the El Observatorio Romano, uh, which is the official Vatican media outlet, and, and the spokesman for the Vatican said that actually at the end of March 2012, he returned from a trip, he went into the Vatican, he got before the Curia, the, the, the Roman government, and he officially turned in his resignation at the end of March or sometime in April 2012. So we found out that Rene Thibault and Chris Putnam and I had actually been accurate. Now, I don't consider myself to be a prophet. That was just a prediction based on a, uh, an enormous amount of research. Now, very quickly then to answer your question, Steve, uh, since that period in time, we have a pope. He's taken the name Pope Francis. Uh, you know, there have been those people that said, "Well, it was all wrong. You guys were wrong. Prophecy of the Pope's wrong. This guy's not named Peter." But I was on shows with Gary Sturman that people can Google that a year before uh, Benedict stepped down, in which. Um, Gary Stearman asked the question about the name Peter the Roman, and I said, absolutely, the next pope does not need to be named Peter. All he needs to be is of Roman descent. And, of course, uh, Bergoglio uh, came along, both his mother and his father, um, full-blooded Italians, and so he is of Roman descent. That's the only thing I thought was possible. Now, having said that, there are uh, some things that uh, have come to light since, that kind of put the cold chills in you, if you will. So, first of all, he names himself after Francis of Assisi. Uh, Francis of Assisi was a Roman friar that lived in the late 1100s, early 1200s, but his original name was Francesco di Pietro, or Peter de Bernardone. This is a man whose name literally translates Peter the Roman, which is the last line in the prophecy of the Pope. And when he named himself after Francis, I just um, I you could have you could have knocked me over <laughs> with a feather, right? He literally names himself after somebody whose name is identified in the final line of the prophecy of the popes, but then it got better. Francis of Assisi was also a mystic. He was a prophet, and he prophesied about the final pope. He was he he was born and lived only about 50 years after the prophecy of the popes was given by Malachi O'Morgair. The uh, you know the Irish mystic that is who allegedly gave that prophecy. So he was alive at the time. He may have been aware of it, uh, but it doesn't matter because he actually prophesied of a final pope, a final one. And guess what he said about him? He said he will be a deceiver. He will be a destroyer. Uh, he will not be a true pope. The fact that that Bergoglio is a Jesuit. He has degrees in history and science. He knows the prophecy of the popes. He knows the prophecies of uh, Francis Assisi, who predicted that the final pope would be a deceiver and a destroyer and not a true prophet, and he takes that as his namesake. I mean, just absolutely astonishing, right? And then now, just like 10 or 12 days ago, he names Pietro Perilin as uh, his uh, secretary of state, a second man whose name is literally translated Peter the Roman. So I, I'm telling you, I think this guy knows something, and I think he knows his role, and he is playing it exactly the way that he ought to be playing it. And the world is in love with him because he is making the world believe that he is in love with them. And that's exactly, exactly the scenario that is needed for the coming of the false prophet and the Antichrist. Now, let me finally say that I want to give Bergoglio the benefit of the doubt. I'm not a Catholic. I don't agree with Catholic teachings. Uh, But whether or not he will indeed be the false prophet or in the you know in the Protestant reformers' mind, he would be the Antichrist. By the way, most people don't know. Evangelicals definitely don't know. Most of them today that we are the very first generation of evangelicals uh, uh, of Protestants, and for that matter, of some Catholics. We are the first generation that did not hold in our theology that the uh, Pope would be the Antichrist. From the Middle Ages forward, we are the first generation that didn't hold that point of view. So, but it's going to remain to be seen. Now, if I can, let me just jump back and tie up scenario number two, 
uh, which I was talking about these bio-enhanced humans. Can I do that? Yes. Uh, bio-enhanced humans, cognitive abilities, astonished that uh, the Global Governance 2025 actually tied uh, these scenarios together with the emergence of a new form of uh, humanity. Um, there was um, an article recently published, Foreign Policy, called A Predictable Future for Technology, and here's what it said, quote, as we try to understand an incipient future in which technology has insinuated itself into every sphere and nook of human activity, from the manipulation and replication of DNA, okay, Steve Quayle level stuff, to space exploration, and in which humans continuously seek ways to speed up their biological evolution to match the breakneck pace of technological evolution, the only way to do that is to incrementally integrate with technology, launching an era of change and innovation that we call the hybrid age. If the first wave was agrarian and tribal, the second industrial and national, and the third informational and transnational, then the hybrid age is the fourth wave. In this new era, human evolution will become human Technology co-evolution. We're becoming part of the machine, and it is becoming part of us, end quote. And I, I wanted to quote that to you because I thought it so succinctly described. Uh, well, part of the research that I've been doing for the last three years that's going to come out in the documentary film in human, but it really describes uh, what the global governance uh, report was saying that we are at a point in time that is unavoidable. The humans are going to incrementally be integrated with technology, and that is a perfect uh, scenario for the arrival of an antichrist and mark of the beast system. And and for people that are listening that think it sounds like an incredible dream or nightmare, Steve, look at how quickly technology of that sort is is spreading into the broader culture right now. I mean, currently there's tests that are being conducted that allow people to interact with computers, smartphones, tablets, uh, simply by using their minds. Game systems have been on the market for the last few years that let players control functions of games by thought alone, by wearing uh, a rubber cap that reads and translates the brain's electrical impulses. You might have seen more recently uh, where uh, systems are under development there at the University of Washington, did you see that? That allows yes. one person to send a brain signal over the Internet to a second gamer that is sitting across the university campus in a different building, but he's also wearing a similar cap, and that person is involuntarily clicking a tab with his index finger playing a game as signals are being received from the first person who's who's actually playing the game by using the second person's mind, if that makes sense. Um, uh, over the next few years, people everywhere are going to be turning on their lights at home, uh, sending emails, and yes, even transferring monetary funds according to leading academic and industrial reports on this matter using thought-controlled and brain-machine interfacing without ever pulling their wallets or their checkbooks from their pockets or or uh, purses. So welcome to the Borg that uh, Steve Quayle and Tom Horn have been talking about for the last few years. And, you know, Steve, I can remember back when only, uh, you know, a decade ago, you and I were talking about this stuff as a possible near-future reality. Well, it's not a near-future reality anymore. It's today. It's the science that's happening right now. Uh, in fact, the New York Times ran an article I have in front of me, Disruptions, Brain-Computer Interfaces Inch Close to Mainstream, in, what they're, in which they're talking about the chips inside your head are now going to be uh, replaced by extracranial capabilities. You're literally just going to walk around. Your new cap, in the next couple of years, you guys that drive John Deere tractors, you're going to go into John Deere and you're going to buy your cute green uh, John Deere hat, but you're going to buy the one that inside of it, 
has a chip that has the ability to extracranially read the neural impulses of your brain that's going to allow you to drive your tractor by thought alone. You think that's astonishing? That's absolutely what's being reported in peer-reviewed te- uh, technology journals right now. It's just astonishing. And Tom, but Tom, let me interrupt that. If most people will think back to a Clint Eastwood movie called Firefox, Mm-hmm. Where he's a pi- fire pilot, and because he can he can speak Russian, he goes and steals a Russian advanced fighter that you can fly by thoughts. I can tell you. I and again, listen. I want to make this clear to everyone. I don't know stuff unless people tell me stuff. Either my source information either has to be people in the field, or, and lately, uh, the living God in answer to a lot of your uh, uh, intercession on be- my behalf. But I can tell you this. Nothing that comes out in time, like at this time, it's already integrated. I know that in the past, I mean, you know, it was there were times when when we would talk about, let's just say this, the giants, and in my position is they already are on Earth. They're in uh, hives. If they're in stasis, they're in laboratories. If they're currently alive, I've had, you know, I brought on the pilot that flew the dead giant out of Afghanistan that had wiped out and eaten a special operations group until the real guys, when I say this, guys that know how to deal with the Giants went in and got them. So the point that, and even to the day, you know, people still throw stuff up to me from our our previous programs. I remember when you named a date, and I forget, was it three or four years ago, when you said you thought the first appearance with Giants, and that very day, two cops in uh, Britain, actually two separate groups of cops, saw the giants where the uh, uh, Uffington giant is, the giant or the CERN giant on the fields of, uh, of, of one of the British towns. And do you know this? I had that on my website. I even remember sending you the email, and that story has been totally scrubbed unless someone hard copy printed it out. When I transferred uh, uh, servers and everything else, I lost it off my website. So the thing that I'm trying to tell people is this. What they're proposing is, when I say this, that's milk. These guys are on uh, steroids and retro rockets. It's like Ben Rich's old statement. If the American people ever knew that anything they can imagine, that we've already been beyond the stars. So when I see rockets and spaceships and, and the stuff that what I call is for public consumption, the, the real stuff has been in, in motion, if you will, for, for probably 50 years or more because of reverse engineering. And you and I have covered uh, Roswell, Dave, David Flynn, when he was alive, covered it. Uh, you know, I mean, everybody's covered it so well. But what I think the cover-up, and here's where I want to say, because we're coming down the last minutes of the show, ladies and gentlemen, if you understood what really exists now, you would understand the motivating force. Because, Tom, I don't believe any of this stuff is future anymore. I believe it's present now. And I, that's not to be contentious or to be confronting or confrontational, because, man, I love you, and, uh, but I'm just saying this. It's really hard even to researchers to get them to see that, you know, I mean, if I talk about human cloning already be to the point where you can grow up anybody from, you know, in nine months to any age you want, and if you understand what aging the process is from a genetic level, and you're talking about people now talking about finding the eternity gene, or the Methuselah gene, as it's really called. The, the point is, is that I'm just saying this. It's almost, Tom, and I know you and I have talked about this, and I will put it into remembrance of anybody else. It was fascinating to me that until you wrote about certain things, i.e. the Stargates, I had never, ever in my life uh, understood that scripture, and the gates of hell will not prevail until you, on the radio one night, you gave that. And like uh, you know, a bomb going off in my brain, which seems like bombs go off my brains a lot. I'm bombed out. The bottom line is, is that that there are times that are key. I would say this contact points with the release of the technology and the revelation of the technology. That just simply means when we write about it, it seems like at that point it's introduced into the common uh, uh, man's thought process, just like this show. Does that make sense to you? What I'm saying is we're kind of like time seals that as the Lord gives us uh, uh, continuing revelation and we share that with the people of God, they, they are brought from, let's just say, they're brought from maybe a, a um, 
whatever level of understanding to graduate physics. And I'm not talking about having to understand the math or anything. I'm just saying that God is accelerating the knowledge just like the parable of the people who came late in the day to work for the workmen. And he paid the people that came late in the day the same as he paid those who started first in the day. And I believe that's a principle of the eternal heart of God, that whether I've got a 19-year-old listening to me, a 9-year-old, or a 90-year-old, God will bring you to the point where your questions are answered, you'll have his perspective, and by his wonderful intervention, you know, Tom, you and I have been able, you know, and thanks to the largesse of Doug Hagman and Joe Hagman, to come on shows like this and present uh, the most amazing future glimpse, but there's nothing future now. I would call it now present revealing. Right. Um, how much time do we have for the rest of the show? Uh, you got uh, about 17 minutes, and go ahead and take it. I pretty much okay, said my soliloquy. So- let me let, let me just let me just hit the the, the third scenario and then con, and then bring all this stuff to a conclusion. So the point, Steve, that you're making is the technology for the BC end time system is here now. We're not waiting on it; it's here, and all of the uh, the Antichrist needs is the trigger event, and that could come in the form of a well, it could come as we had talked about as a uh, you know an attack. On our infrastructure, it could come from a global financial meltdown, but something that brings the world to its knees and then introduces a modern, more secure method of buying, selling via high-tech marks, whatever highly educated economists around the world are saying that we're on the precipice of that cascading event. Now, the third uh, scenario, number three, natural or manufactured global pandemic is also being talked about. And as you guys know, scannable implants, tattoo transmitters, stuff's all becoming more sophisticated. But now, in the last decade, it's not just becoming sophisticated, it's becoming prophetic in the sense that components such as merging human biological matter with transistors to create living implantable machines is also now a reality. Steve said it's here. He's absolutely right. And those are indisputable facts. Uh, There are also, however, besides biochip technology, we're now creating smart chimeric vaccines. These are vaccines that are a blend of human and animal uh, material, but they're also programmed. They can literally rewrite DNA. And I believe that all three of the scenarios, uh, the possibility that the mark of the beast could arrive uh, through, it could be all three, But in my personal opinion, this might be the most potent one, a pandemic that necessitates some kind of either biochip or smart chimeric vaccine payload delivery system that literally has the ability to rewrite DNA. Uh, I think that if, uh, well, I think that's likely to result in the beastly system or to be combined. And so, because I know I don't hardly have any time, let me just very quickly remind listeners Steve Quell and I did a show uh, a few years back in which I brought up hey Steve my wife Nita brought up a point I had never thought about and her point was she had asked if the biblical mark of the beast could be a conspiracy that employed specific implantable or smart chimeric technology that's only now available uh, 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 scientifically her theory was pretty gripping and since that time actually has kind of become the popular theory of an awful lot of other people who are writing about it and not giving her credit, but it did originate with her. And that is that uh, the U.S. government, some other government, they devise a virus. It's a crossover between human and animal disease. Let's say an entirely new, highly contagious influenza, uh, influenza mutation. This is in the news today, by the way. And then they intentionally release it into the public. A pandemic ensues. The period between when a person contacts the virus and death is very short, maybe 10 days or something. Within a very short period of time, hundreds of thousands of people around the globe are dying, and this whole universal cry for a cure goes out. And then seemingly, miraculously, the government steps forward and they have a vaccine. The only catch, the government explains, is that given the nature of the animal-human flu, the cure uses animal DNA and nanobots or something like that to rewrite one's genetics so that the person is no longer entirely human. And the point made by Anita was that those who received this antidote would have their genetics remade. They would become part beast, therefore perhaps 
the title, Mark of the Beast, but no longer entirely human would also mean, according to that outline, that the individual couldn't be saved, couldn't go to heaven, and therefore would reveal why the book of Revelation says whoever receives it is going to become Dan forever. Okay, there's a whole theory around that that she developed, but uh, in order to find out if the science behind that abstract was reasonable, I, I, uh, Steve, I contacted our mutual friend Sharon Gilbert, whose graduate work includes molecular biology. She affirmed not only was that thesis solid, but that research is being done now that could actually implement that strategy. Uh, everything that we are going to be publishing on Raiders News Network very, very soon under a new series that you'll probably see starting this weekend titled Beast Tech is going to foreshadow that very real, very near future possibility. And I want to strongly admonish people to pay close attention to that series. It might be the most important one we've ever done because I'm going to tell you right now behind the scenes there is a system and there is a man of horrendous, Unseen intelligence uh, who is readying to emerge on the world scene as a savior. He was predicted in the scripture, but most people are not going to understand him for what he is. And Steve, scholars, including some of the most celebrated Christian leaders, are going to be the ones heralding his uncanny ability at resolving whatever emergency gives rise to his appearance. And they will be there assuring congregations of his godliness, scoffing at you, scoffing at me, and it is going to help give rise to a war that is going to be initiated within the institution of Christianity itself. And what I want to ask listeners, because I know I'm pressed for time here, will you be ready to recognize this end times great deceiver, to escape the mass delusion? that the Bible says is going to befall all them that dwell on the earth, Luke 21. Will you escape damnation, Luke 21? Will you be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, it says? Well, there's only one one way to know for sure. Accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Repent of your sins. If you will or if you have, then he also promises, Revelation 3.10, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which will come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. But also know this, Revelation 12:11 says, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death, Revelation 12:11. Steve, a war has already started, and it, but it's going to get intense. And for those that doubt that even their celebrated religious leaders are going to be heralding and celebrating the man of sin and his national identification system. How much time do I have right now? You've got another ten minutes, so take it. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Let me let me just let me just give you some points and facts, so you'll know this is not just originating from the mind of Tom Horn. Uh, number one, in January of this year, Robert Robert A. Pastor professor of international relations at American University, argued before the United States Congress that the the majority of Americans are now ready for and need a national identification system based on head and hand biometrics. This can be Googled and proved. He, a centerpiece of the immigration bill that is right now currently working its way through Congress imagines his scenario and it will require all citizens to have a biometric card without which nobody is going to be approved for employment effectively rendering them a non-person unless they submit to that national bio identification. I realize that this is still working its way through Congress. There are some that are for it, there are some that are against it, and maybe now it's even going to be delayed until next year, 2014, when the blood moons start kicking in. Number two, three months ago in June, the Congress of the United States pushed forward on related mandates demanding progress on advanced biometric smart cards for federal identification under the Homeland Security Presidential Directive. This is HSPD-12. And the DHS wants personal verification IDs immediately and for them to carry digitalized finger and or palm, that is hand, from facial recognition, that is hand and head, to serve 
as the trendsetter for all levels of government and private industry identification, those cards are going to employ barcodes, RFID tags, and onboard data processes processors that are uh, advanced enough that they'll actually transmit information and location to remote sites. We're not talking 200 feet, 300 feet. These are to national uh, databases, and that's what the government right now is demanding. Number three, several times over the last 60 days, the use of biometrics, that is hand or head iris scanning, as a payment option for goods and services has been documented as the method of choice for buying and selling among 50% or more of all consumers, and that percentage trend is moving upward. Now, uh, number four, just 30 days ago, a special report conducted by Natural Security, this is a United Kingdom-based authority and user of authentication that works with the uh, government of Britain, they just described a 900 consumer test People who had participated in a pilot program in which they used fingerprint-based technology and eye scanning when purchasing products and services. Why am I mentioning this? Because 94% of the participants exited that scheme agreeing that they are now ready to use biometrics and RFID, uh, uh, te RFID technology for all future buying and selling. Number five, just three weeks ago, a new report from the National Institute of Standards and Technology confirmed, and you probably read this, that the long-term viability of iris recognition as being stable for biometric identification, that is, that no distinguishing texture degradation occurs of the iris uh, for at least 10 years, if not decades, was illustrated showing that iris head scanning is uh, is a legitimate methodology for using biometric identification as we move into the future. Number six, a whole host of personal products are now flooding the market all at the same time. Have you noticed that? Jewelry, headgear, glasses, all of this stuff that both GPS and RFID tracking capabilities with promises of future payment integration for buying and selling via biometric uh, signatures. You might have saw the example just a couple of weeks ago in the new the NIMI bracelet, the M-Y-M-I bracelet, do you guys see that? It's worn around the wrist. It monitors your biometric signatures, claims to be more accurate than some of the other systems. Uh, I'm just quickly, number seven, at the same time that uh, Terry Cook and my investigative report is headed to the editors, 19 states in the United States have complied with the Real ID Act, which is an act of Congress that modifies U.S. federal laws pertaining to authentication standards for driver's license. But the purpose of it is the goal of codifying a national and then international biometric ID system. Well, all of that is happening concurrent with this immigration reform bill, which now may be delayed until next year, but that includes a provision to mandate universal biometric identification in the form of a national ID, without which nobody is going to be federally approved for employment, or in other words, as the book of Revelation 13 says, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark. And let me finally say this. One version is called E-Verify. I know you guys are familiar with it. Incredibly, uh, it's, it has bipartisan support among lawmakers. But furthermore, and this is where it gets interesting, it's got enthusiastic approval from notable Christian leaders. But this, inclu this includes, let me just name some names real fast. Leith Anderson, president of the National Association of Evangelicals. Stephen Bauman, the president and CEO of World Relief. Jim Daly, the president of Focus on the Family. Noel Castellana, CEO of Christian Community of Development Association. Louise Cortez, the president of Esperanza. Dr. Richard Lamb, the president of Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention. Samuel Rodriguez, the president of the National Hispanic Christian Leadership Congress. Dr. Carl Rudy, the vice president for Student Life. Gabriel uh, Salquero, president of the National Latino Evangelical Co Coalition. Matt Staver, the founder, founder and chairman of Liberty Council. Jim Wallace, the president and CEO of Sojourners. And that list goes on. And then finally, the Catholic Church, to make this full circuit, Steve, this month, 
September 2013 announced a massive coordinated effort to get the immigration reform bill passed by targeting 60 Catholic House Republicans and 130 members of the House that are also Catholic. But in course, local evangelical pastors nationwide are now broadcasting radio ads in 56 congressional districts in 14 states at a cost of $400,000 in support of this plan. So my point is, yes, whether you know it or not, well-known religious and Christian community leaders are going to justify support of a coming global identification system. Uh, 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 Well, so the fact that some so-called Christian leaders are going to be part of the beast system. It's probably not a surprise, but it masks this other reality that we're going to see unfolding very quickly, and that is a war between true believers and religious persons. And right now there are those um, who call themselves Christians, but they're committed to nothing more than trying to close the mouth of God's true witnesses. They are right now attacking Steve Quayle, Gary Stearman, Chuck Missler. Uh, they are uh, uh, posthumously attacking our friend uh, who wrote uh, Temple at the Center of Time. Uh, and uh, the, the war has begun. It's only going to get worse. I can hear you breathing. I realize I'm out of time. I apologize. Uh, but I hope that I have brought to the attention of the listener that we have entered into a period of time that likely is going to lead to the arrival of the Antichrist and an Antichrist system. Wow. I'll tell you what, the, and I want to just say one last thing in one minute. The determining factor, the deciding factor, will be the name of Jesus and the Bible will be outlawed. Faith will be persecuted by unbelief. And that's why Jesus said, they hated me, they're going to hate you. There's going to come a time when they're going to kill us and think they're doing God a favor. And people flee from the big box preachers, flee for your life, your life depends on it. If you're in one of the mega churches, flee 